infrastructure, we we have a quorum. I just welcome all members who are in the room um, and just remind them to maintain social distancing and to those who are attending via Starleaf. Today we will consider subordinate legislation. We have a briefing from the Electric Vehicle Association, NI, with regards to our committee inquiry into decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland. And we then have a departmental briefing again on our committee inquiry. Um, again, as per usual, just remind those members who are attending via Starleaf um, to raise their hands via the icon um, just to register their wish to ask any questions at each agenda item. And also, could I ask all those members um, to mute their microphones as well as it may interfere with the evidence session? Um, can I also underline and re emphasise that? We need to vacate this room at 12 today, um, at the very latest. So can I just ask you to keep that in mind just as we go through um, the various agenda items. Apologies, I have apologies for lateness from Mr Muir and from, from Mr Hilditch. So they do intend to be at the meeting. Does anyone else have or aware of any apologies? Okay, no, good, thank you. Moving then to... Um, um, chair's business. Uh, we do have a communication from um, the, you recall, from the Committee for the Economy with regards to future engagement with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the Northern Ireland Committee's um, chairs. And the suggestion was that this should be um, taken via correspondence. Um, I also understand that the Agriculture Committee and also um, Finance are considering doing this also. So are members content that um, we proceed in a, in a similar fashion? Okay. Thank you. See so the next meeting for that was scheduled for, two, for Thursday the 27th of May, so if we're content to do that, that would be helpful. Moving then to our draft minutes at page 6, and that's for the meeting of the 12th of May. Are members um, content to agree? Yep. Okay. Um, moving mm. then to matters arising at page 15, again for the same meeting of the 12th of May. Do members have any issues arising from the meeting? No. Content. Thank you. Moving then to um, outstanding uh, requests for information. Um, you'll find that at page 18. And again, you'll see where the committee staff have tried to pursue some of those pieces of correspondence, and um, they're still outstanding. I suppose it's just a just endeavour to to push forward with that. Um, moving then to page 23, um, we have our proposed committee motion on unadopted rules. Um, members have had the opportunity to to look at that. Um, we have taken advice from the um, business office and tentatively scheduled the debate for the 2nd of June. This is the earliest date that can be scheduled. Later dates are available if the committee prefers. So I'm assuming that members have had the opportunity to to read the, the motion. I'll run through it very quickly. And if we can get um, some agreement on the wording initially, and then when you would like this to be scheduled, so that this assembly recognises systemic failures in the current process for adopting roads and services in new developments, notes with concern the Department for Infrastructure's inability to quantify precise numbers of those affected, recognises the resourcing constraints within the department that exacerbate the problem, and notes with concern the lack of progress made in addressing these failures since they were highlighted in a regional development committee report in 2012 acknowledges the impact these feelings are having on communities living in affected developments and calls on the Minister for Infrastructure to take steps to reduce the backlog of unadopted roads and services as a matter of urgency, to work with executive colleagues to identify areas where cross-departmental working can be used to alleviate the impact of resource constraints, and in line with the 2012 report recommendations to formulate and implement a more robust and time-constrained package of guidance and enforcement that includes ensuring appropriate bond levels to complete works and a review of the main statutory instruments. It's very Are comprehensive. Content with <coughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very comprehensive, Chair. 
members coming through via Starleaf. Any comments to make? Is there anything content? Great, Chair. Reasonable. Perfect, thank you. Um, and just with regards to the date of the debate, are you content for the 2nd of June? 1st of June. Oh, sorry, it's the 1st of June, is it? Mm -hmm. It's the Tuesday. The Tuesday uh, is the 1st of June. Yes, it is. My notes are not otherwise, but that's fine, the 1st of, the first of June. Um, okay, I'm content with that. Great, thank you very much. That was very straightforward. Moving then through to correspondence and just there's a number of items of, of correspondence um, in your pack from pay at the correspondence um, memo is at page 25 and then tabled at page three are there any particular items that members wish to highlight we do have um, we have correspondence from the Transport Hub Alternative Group requesting to meet the committee. Are, are you content that perhaps that we do meet them on an, uh, be on an informal basis? With, because they have written to us on a number of occasions and I'm conscious of that. Are members content? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and we also have um, correspondence from Coney requesting to brief the committee. And I've also spoken to Karen McGill in the last number of days as well. Are members content that we perhaps um, schedule a briefing from both of those organisations, um, obviously as we move now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Mr Buchanan. Mm -hmm. You're content? Mr. Chair, I'm assuming that's page 76 of the correspondence from the bus operators. This was I just want to make sure. Page 63, um, Coney, Coney, we're in that. Somebody's mic isn't it? muted, it must be. S sorry? Somebody's mic maybe not muted on screen, is it? Okay. Uh, some feedback, I'm afraid. Um, okay. So what you're what you're saying, you're going to agree to me to highlight the the difficulties of the bus and coach operators. Yes. And, and call for more support if need be, if, if after agreeing to to meet with them and listening to them for the sector moving forward. Yeah, would agree to that. And thank you, Chair. And, that, and that'll be for both organisations. Yeah. If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Members, any other issues that they want to raise? Um, we also have um, a there's a request for a response from the um, Agriculture and Environment Committee with regards to the climate okay. change bill, and <laughs> they're, they're asking for a response by the 18th of June. And obviously, we're we're progressing through our own findings around um, decarbonisation transport. So that work's ongoing. So if members are content that we perhaps hold on that response until we get further information just with regards to our own inquiry business and we can then forward that to to the committee at that stage if you're content. Agreed. Agreed. Um, okay. Members, Mr Buchanan. Just one point, Chair, on the response from... Um, <coughs> Nicola Mall, the Minister, in regard to briefing us with regard to contracts, etc., how they're awarded, and obviously the issue with ongoing issue on roads, especially to the West. I'd like to take up that offer on that. Uh, it's item two, or sorry, it's page 73, and it's point two. Yep. Just to get an update on where that contract is at, and yeah, how, we, the, how, the process have, of awarding those contracts. Okay, we we have requested that officials come to yeah. talk to us yeah. about procurement yeah. on, a, on a broader issue. Fair enough. And obviously, yeah. I don't know how specific they can be, particularly if these things are now in court. Yeah, but yeah, it would yeah. be useful to have that. So um, that's being scheduled for a future meeting. Do we have a, a date for that as yet? Yes. I'm sorry, if we just have a look at the forward route program. Yeah. The 9th of June. Okay. Okay. Members content with that? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Can I just come in on the point as well, please? Of course. Yeah, no, it's just on page 74 there in relation to um, the feedback from the Minister on the A1. And it said about in overall terms that uh, around collisions, there were 12% more collisions per kilometre on the A1 than on average of the other dual carriageways and 29% more fatal collisions per kilometre. Um, and I think you know it's safe to say those figures show really show the urgency mm -hmm. um, to get this road scheme delivered. So I was wondering if we were able to get more detail on the figures. For example, at what you know at what points on on the air one is it most dangerous? Um, and then just a wee bit more detail on that because I think um, they're really it's a really important piece of information. Okay, members content. Yep. Okay, thank you. Any other um, items of correspondence that fish? Members wish to comment on at this stage? No? Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
So you're content then to action as suggested in the, the correspondence memo. Okay. Moving then to item six, which is the subordinate legislation, SL1s, which are not subject to assembly procedure. At page 79, we have SL1, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Newton Abbey Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. At page 81, SL1, the One Way Traffic Belfast Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Page 83, SL1, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Ballymean Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Page 86, SL1, the Parking Place, Greencastle Street, Kilkeel Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Page 88, SL1, the Control of Traffic, Londonderry Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Obviously, these proposals are not subject to Assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposals as set out? Great. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Moving then to item 7, which is... SL1, the Low Road Newry Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, at page 91. The proposal is subject to negative resolution. A, the rule will abandon an area of 548 square metres of former road at U5344 Low Road Newry, starting at a point 12 metres south of its former junction with Fork Hill Road and extending for 78 metres in a southerly direction. The department is of the view that this area of former road is not necessary and may be abandoned. The abandonment has been requested by the adjacent landowner to regularise the situation on the ground. This is superseded road and the bed and soil of the area to be abandoned is owned by three separate landowners. The abandoned area will then revert to the adjacent landowners. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Great. Yeah. Item 8, this is the subordinate um, legislation again, not subject to assembly procedures. There are two statutory rules um, at page 96 and at page 99. At page 96 we have SR 2021 um, 122, the on-street parking, residence parking zone, Rugby Road, College Park Avenue area, Belfast Amendment Order, Northern Ireland, 2021. Page 99 with SR 2021, 123, the road races, Croft Hill Climb, Order, Northern Ireland, 2021. Um, just if you're content to note the statutory rules, unless there's any issues um, to raise on the proposal, if you're content. All content. Great. Moving then to item 9, SR 2021-124, the Lake Street Lurgan Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, page 105. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 14th of April mm -hmm. and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with the rule? Great. Uh, the <coughs> Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2021-124, the Lake Street Lurgan Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Moving then to item 10, <coughs> SR 2021-125, the Common Market Hill Road, Newton Hamilton, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, page 113. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 14th of April 2021, and we were content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Content. But the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2021-125, the Common Market Hill Road, Newton Hamilton Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Item 11, which is SR 2021-126, the Dunbar Link and Great Patrick Street, Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, at page 122. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 5th of May 2021 and was content. <coughs> the rule is subject to negative resolution. 
there has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Agreed. But the Committee for Infrastructure has com considered SR 2021-126, the Dunbar Link in Great Patrick Street, Belfast Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our briefings um, in relation to our committee inquiry. I suppose really is just still to note that um, unfortunately our researcher is still unwell. Um, and if members are content, that perhaps the, the committee sent him a note just to um, to wish him well. In oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Um, and hopefully that he'll have a speedy recovery and be back with us. So. I'm just content to do that. Okay, so moving then to item 12, which is our briefing from Electric Vehicle Association Northern Ireland. Um, Hansard will record the meeting. We have our briefing paper is at page 130. And for information at page 133, we have assembly research information, um, on the, the pathway to net zero, reducing emissions from road transport in Northern Ireland. And also at page 143, we've also assembly research paper on electric vehicle waste, which again, we had requested. So I want to welcome um, via Starleaf. We have um, Mark McCall, who is the director of Electric Vehicle Association in Northern Ireland. We have Darren Henderson, who again is a director, Ronan Davidson Kernan, who is a director, and Mark Boyle, also a director of Electric Vehicle Association Northern Ireland. And you're all very welcome to um, the committee this morning. Thank you for participating in our inquiry. And could I ask, I th is it Mark going to lead off, or oh, do we have? A, is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Chair. Yes, thank you. Okay, so if you'd like to um, commence, and then if and if your colleagues wish to come in, then after that, if you can sort of be the, the go-to person from yeah. my perspective. Will do. Thank you. thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to talk about the role of EVs in the decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland this morning. Our group was formed in 2016 and earlier this year transitioned to the EV Association Northern Ireland, a not-for-profit community interest company. Our two main aims are to represent the interests of electric vehicle users in Northern Ireland and also to promote EV use here. I'm sure the committee members will be well aware that there's a single overriding issue facing EV drivers here, and that's the size and the condition of our public charging network. Rolled out from 2011, much of this hardware has reached the end of its useful life, and our snapshot in February showed that more than a quarter of AC chargers and around half of all DC chargers here are out of order. Seeing blocked and broken chargers is a disincentive to anyone considering changing to an EV, but it's much worse if you already drive one. I'd like to read you just a few of the comments we've received from EV drivers over the last few months. My lease deal is up in November, seriously considering going back to diesel, and yes, it's because of how terrible the charging infrastructure is in Northern Ireland. There are now less chargers than when I got my car two years ago. As it's so bad here, both my father and myself have reverted back to diesel cars. You cannot rely on the charging network here. It's appalling. We really have enjoyed having a leaf. Unfortunately, we have to go back to diesel due to the unreliability of the network. And for a business looking to bring EVs into our fleet, how do we do it when the infrastructure isn't supporting it? Vans would not be able to return to base if they cannot charge. So then, not only is the current network stopping some people converting to an EV, including businesses, it's also forcing some drivers back to fossil fuel. In fact, a recent survey showed that 58% have considered a return to petrol or diesel, directly due to issues with the public charging network here. So what can be done? We published a six-point plan in February this year, which identified matched funding from DFI to ESB as the fastest, most effective way of getting things back on track here. ESB tell us it's currently difficult for them to identify a business case for the rollout of replacement chargers here and that they need matched funding to complete the work. Importantly, this will allow them to finally turn on pay to charge and with that comes the ability to free up chargers 
by penalising drivers who abuse the current fee service using overstay fees. This has proved successful in the south where it's been in operation for 18 months now. The Interreg Faster project promises more than 20 new rapid chargers across Northern Ireland and we certainly welcome this investment. However, it's still two years away and we believe these units may be limited to just 50 kilowatts. This was a standard 10 years ago, but we'd like to see 100 kilowatt chargers here at a minimum. As battery sizes have grown, we need to make sure charging speeds increase too. A recent Ulster University study by Patrick Keatley showed that in 2020, we dumped 465 gigawatt hours of renewable wind energy here. That has a retail value of almost £80 million pounds, and in EV terms represents around 1.6 billion miles of carbon-free driving, or to put it in local context, more than 11 million return journeys from Belfast to Derry, London, Derry. So we also need to make some changes to our electricity network that will provide the consumer side flexibility required. While new technology allows for certain advances behind the meter, NIE networks tell us the rollout of smart meters here is needed to facilitate this transition. This in turn will require decarbonisation to become part of our utility regulated remit. And this change will help promote innovation, remove barriers to competition and allow tariff reform. We expect many of these issues can be solved in the new DFE energy strategy, which DFI are involved with. Although once again, it looks like this work may take years rather than months. We know that DFI are currently helping local councils too, as they prepare to apply for part of the £20 million ORCS grant. We would like to see the department take a much more active role here, leading our 11 councils and fast-tracking the removal of any barriers to make it as easy as possible for them to add on-street charging quickly. It's important to point out that even if ESB replaced 100% of the network tomorrow, that would really only take us back to where we were 10 years ago. So the final step of our six-point plan is to ensure funding is available for future growth. As we expand the network, we need to ensure that we fill the gaps in the map for CCS charging and that all new sites have 24-7 access, unlike many of our public chargers, which are currently locked up at night. We need service level agreements for guaranteed uptimes, and we should remove the requirements for special cards or apps, always having the option for contactless payments and generally making charging as frictionless as possible. There should be two green spaces painted at every AC charger to maximise the infrastructure we already have, and signage also needs to be improved, as does accessibility for blue badge holders. <coughs> With less expensive running and maintenance costs, EVs generally have a lower total cost of ownership than fossil fuel cars. However, the initial outlay is still too high, as we are several years away from costs reaching parity with internal combustion cars. To help with this issue, Transport Scotland funds an interest-free loan of up to 28,000 for a new EV, up to 10,000 for a new electric motorbike, and up to 6,000 for e-bikes, with repayment terms of up to five years. With governments able to borrow at historically low rates, we would like to see the executive consider a similar initiative for Northern Ireland. And for drivers buying the most affordable second-hand EVs, public charging is particularly important. These cars have the smallest batteries and are most reliant on charging on the go. Also, between 30 and 40 per cent of dwellings in Northern Ireland do not have off-street parking, and hence no way to charge at home. We all want to see a green recovery, and also one that's fair and inclusive. The department often quotes this line in its correspondence. Sustainable modes of transport, including public transport, walking and cycling. We would like to see electric vehicles added here in future, and for the department to be seen to be promoting the change to EVs. <coughs> According to DFI's own travel survey, 71% of all journeys here are by car, covering 83% of total, total distance. We encourage active travel, and public transport for all is a great goal, although clearly one that remains many years away here. One in three people in Northern Ireland live rurally, and that's increasing. We firmly believe in the importance of balance and choice. The car is a lifeline that brings personal freedoms that, for many, are simply not possible by any other means of transport. 
We need new legislation set out for obligations for providing minimum levels of charging in new commercial and domestic developments. As an example, current plans for one Translink car park show 350 spaces with just two designated for EV charging. That's just 0.6% of spaces. In addition, we need charging solutions for our taxi drivers, for charging at our airports, our train stations and our park and rides. We need to encourage EV tourism and provide a network which makes it easy for travellers to visit the north. To sum up then, while electric vehicles are not a panacea, they are part of the solution. An EV is only ever as clean as the source of its electricity, but we are already at 49% renewable energy here, and with targets to increase that to at least 70% by 2030, every EV will become even cleaner over time, decarbonising transport and bringing air quality benefits to our towns and cities. 2020 figures for new plug-in vehicle sales in Northern Ireland show a 290% increase over 2019. So last year we registered almost as many new EVs here as in the seven-year period from 2011 to 2017. This transition is accelerating and we need policy and actions to keep pace. We are around eight and a half years away from the 2030 ban on purely fossil fueled cars. In fact, by September of this year, we'll be just 100 months away from that deadline. 100 months to expand the infrastructure that cannot cope with the 4,700 EVs we have here today into a public charging network to support something more like 400,000 EVs, according to NIE Network's model. We all know the issues and we have the answers. We would very much like to see DFI given the resources to lead this transition, setting up an EV task force, working in partnership with stakeholders to create public policy and targets with measurable outcomes and, importantly, with funding for future growth. Committee, it's time to be ambitious and to drive this change forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. And do any of your colleagues wish to add anything at this stage? No, I think we'll take your questions, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose what's actually quite nice about your presentation is that not only have you brought us the problems and the barriers, but you've also made suggestions um, to try to solve um, a part of this at any, at any rate. Um, can I just ask about your engagement with um, the Department for Infrastructure and the Department for the Economy, just with, in relation um, to the draft energy strategy? And if you have been, if you are part of the working group which has been set up by um, DFI for the transport side of things? So we're, we're not part of the working group, and, and in fairness to, to DFI, we, we probably formed, um, you know, took on the, the legal entity of, of a community interest company a bit too late for that. Um, but we certainly uh, have met the, DF, the DFI officials, and we will be submitting uh, feedback to, to their request for information. Okay, so you, you're right, so you're responding to DFE. Have you met with DFI officials? Yeah, we've met with the minister last October, um, and uh, we uh, put some of our thoughts to the minister. Then, an example of one of the things that we, we mentioned to the minister was that um, a lot of our AC chargers—that's the fast chargers, not the rapid chargers, the one that you see in on streets and in car parks. A lot of those chargers, or most of those chargers, are double-headed. They can charge two uh, two cars at once, but quite often there's only one green space. So we feel that some of the low-hanging fruit is to paint the second space green um, and designate it for EVs, and that way we, we can double the capacity of those chargers in the morning. Um, it was a number of the barriers, obviously, and you've highlighted them um, with regards to infrastructure, and I, I represent the Stryford constituency, and I suppose it's somewhere where we want to attract tourists. We're very poorly served with regards to charging charging points, which creates a, a, a problem not only for residents, for those who are wishing to visit us, um, but other barriers are obviously the, the cost of EVs, and, and, I, and I read this morning on the, on the BBC website um, a commentary with regards to the PAC in, in Westminster, um, and who were very much highlighting the issues around um, support for um, moving to decarbonisation and the issues around um, electric vehicle points. But also, but, and within that was also the cost of the vehicle and the fact that there are only 13 models, which are less than £30,000, which really excludes the vast majority of um, of people of drivers actually you know who would be interested then in moving across to electric vehicles um, so that in itself is an issue which again you sort of highlighted with regards to to grant schemes 
But the other side, the other the other issue around no um, sort of on no off street parking um, solutions. So for those who are living in sort of um, sort of more densely populated areas, particularly around sort of um, streets. What would be the solution for for those drivers if they were looking to um, to invest in electric vehicles? Roland or Mark, do you want to take that one? I, I, I'll take that one. So, so at the at the moment um, here, the, the, there are limited options for those people. They are dependent on the uh, the, the public infrastructure, such as it is. Elsewhere, um, for example, in GB, lo local councils who have the the uh, responsibility for the roads there have worked with um, operators to install charge points on lampposts or on uh, bollards um, on on the side of the road or to uh, put channels in in the footpaths so that you could install a charger on the front of your house but run the cable through the footpath without causing a trip hazard to, to anyone passing by uh, th those chargers those on street chargers do not have to be rapid chargers or even fast chargers they can be the this sort of the seven kilowatt units that you would have on on your house if you had a driveway because the, the model there is sort of slow overnight charging so the the investment in the electrical infrastructure for that would wouldn't be particularly significant particularly as these, these will all be um close to, to houses which already have sufficient supply for this sort of thing. But for this in Northern Ireland, uh, as DFI have responsibility for the roads and on and street furniture, then it's uh, DFI and the road service who have the responsibility for making this work. And this is why it's so important that, DF that DFI work with the councils um, for the ORCS grant scheme that OZEV are making available, as it's the councils that apply to that, but it's because of DFI's role in, in looking after the roads, then uh, DFI have a very important part to play in that. Okay. Uh, um, maybe if I can pick up on the point of affordability, just a, a quick search this morning on a used car website. There are 298 plug-in cars available in Northern Ireland. The cheapest one is £5,000. Um, I guess you, uh, you go up a little in the, the price, you know, £10,000 buys you quite a capable car. Um, but the important thing is these older cars have smaller battery capacities so anybody buying that will rely more heavily on the public charging network so that's why it's important to to support this and to build that network so we can encourage more people um to switch to electric vehicles okay thank you and just just one more point um is in re regard to moving to pay to charge um and mark you highlighted that there is currently an abuse of the current service could you maybe talk us through that Yes, true, Chair. Um, so it, it's free then at the moment. Um, ESP have said that they won't start to take payment until uh, they can provide a reliable service, basically, which, which they can't do at the moment. So we're stuck in this uh, sort of no man's land of free charging and, and chargers. Then there's no investment and no business model and uh, no money to spend on replacing the chargers. And we do get people hogging chargers, people that are inconsiderate and, and parking you know, overnight, for example, and, and blocking charge, um, chargers in Port Rush, for for example, visitors might uh, be staying up there, park at four o'clock in the afternoon, and come back the next morning. You know, denying many people the charge. Uh, so once once pay to charge starts, then there's a, an overstay fee. So for every ten minutes after forty minutes, you, you might get charged five pounds, something like that. So that's operating by ESP in the south and is successful, and they've seen a, a big reduction in, in the chargers being blocked just because of that. And what are, what are the current tariffs in, in the Republic? I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, we, we, the tariffs in, in Northern Ireland and uh, commercial, from, there are some private investors here, and they would range from around uh, 30p per kilowatt hour to 36p per kilowatt hour. That, that, that's the sort of market range at the moment. Just to jump in there, it, it depends usually on the type of, of charge you're getting. So you have the, the fast chargers, like the, the 22 kilowatt units, which will charge your car in a couple of hours. And you have the rapid chargers, which can um, charge your car in a matter of 20 or 30 minutes. And those rapid chargers tend to be more expensive to use just by the, the fact that the, the, they charge your car faster. And they have the more onerous overstay fee because they are the equivalent of your, your, your petrol pump 
on a motorway or something like that. So generally speaking elsewhere, the faster the charger, the more expensive it is to use. And then those sort of slow destination chargers um, that you might find at a hotel or somewhere, if they have a cost at all, would tend to have a relatively low cost, not much more expensive than charging at home. And if I, if I can just add that the actual cost from ESP for in the south would be ranging depending on which chargers Roman says that you use, range between 27 cent per unit slash kilowatt hour up to about 37 for the faster units, so pence per kilowatt hour. So that, and that's that's in line with uh, GB wide uh, pricing schemes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you all for. Uh, I was going to say coming along today, but it's all virtual. Uh, but uh, for attending the, the committee meeting, uh, I must say I must commend you for the work you have done thus far in terms of um, effectively lobbying and engaging in a very professional manner with constructive solutions. Um, there's many different people come to us over the time, and you have stood out as someone, who, uh, an organisation which is doing it on a voluntary basis, but being very professional in what you're doing and coming forward with constructive solutions. So that is greatly appreciated, and it's a testimony to yourselves. Um, I think you probably share with yourselves great frustration around the state of the EV charging network uh, and the need for um, departments and potentially someone to just take a grip of it and to drive forward change and improvements in relation to this. Um, it's probably one of the best examples of things falling between different silos and silo departmental working, and no one's prepared to drive this forward. And that's not good enough. We need someone to drive this forward. And for, from my perspective also, you know, the Department of the Economy have responsibility for energy, um, but also the Department of Infrastructure has responsibility for transport. And if we're going to try to encourage people to move towards decarbonised uh, public transport and a greener and more sustainable future, there needs to be a lead taken from the Department of Infrastructure. There are so many different things need to be done. I'd be interested to know from yourselves if there's one thing that you think that the Department of Infrastructure should take forward to address this, what would that be? Yeah, if, if I can answer that. Um, it's already been alluded to here uh, by Mark's part of the presentation. Uh, the current situation with the, the charge network being free uh, but crumbling, both in disincentivizes both the public from using it, uh, as Mark's already alluded to, and people returning back to diesel because it's not working, but it also disincentivizes organizations, other service providers from coming in because it's very hard to, to uh, compete with the free network. So that, that's one thing. So in, in terms of what we can do about that, I think the single most effective action that DFI can do is, is create the conditions where progress can be made on that, and that's the match funding that we outlined in our six-point plan. Uh, if, if, I mean, it is a relatively small amount of money um, that we would need. Uh, an example of that was the, the £20 million blue-green fund that was, was announced, and the minister herself said that um, there's potential for the department to play a more proactive role in terms of supporting the improvement of the infrastructure. We're talking about 5 to 7% of that fund. To, uh, to promote this network and build this network, bring it back, uh, admittedly, to what it was 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, it was one of the better networks in Europe, and now it's the worst in Europe. So it, it's a relatively small thing. So I think my, my personal feeling is if we can uh, prioritize some of that money towards that, that would make a big step forward. Uh, and if, we, if there is a prioritization within that amount of money that ESB would require in the match funding, we are prioritised towards the rapid chargers that have been outlined here, the ones that should be on the main arterial routes that would charge the cars faster. That's that's where the money should be spent and, and directed towards that. That feels like something that could happen relatively quickly. ESB are primed to do this. We realise some of the things in the energy strategy will take time, but that is somewhat low-hanging fruit as well. It could really make a difference pretty quickly in Northern Ireland. Yeah, and just one more question. See, in terms of the commercial providers, uh, I have had discussions with one of them. There's a real lack of them within the network here in Northern Ireland, and potentially one of the issues what's in heaven is obviously because the current failing, broken network is free. But is there any other areas which is inhibiting them coming in to be able to provide that network? Because when you look at other countries and you visit them, well, you used to be able to visit them, uh, <laughs> uh, you're able to see the charging network was in place. And it's just like, why is Northern Ireland lagging behind in terms of being able to attract those commercial providers? One, one of the big issues is that uh, for a provider looking to 
build a, a rapid charger, particularly here, the entire cost of connecting to the electrical grid is passed on to the connectee. Uh, so if, if you want to build a bank of chargers, you have to pay not only the cost of installing the bank of chargers, but the cost of any grid upgrades required to support that. Whereas if you go elsewhere, that part of that, at least part of that cost uh, varies depending on where you go. But in, in GB, it's, for example, it's somewhere around 50 or, uh, 40 or 50 percent of that reinforcement cost is socialized. Whereas here, it's passed on entirely to the connectee. So what, what that means effectively is that it is much more expensive here to uh, to connect rapid chargers to install rapid charges than it is elsewhere um, and that is because at nie networks pass that are, are obliged to pass that cost on uh, through the, because of their license obligations and that comes back to the issue of the remit of the utility regulator not including decarbonization uh, the the ur's remit uh, only uh, means that they, they must force nie to to do things that are the most economical for the electricity customer, but doesn't take into account that uh, investment required for decarbonization, which again is not the case for the, the off-gem in, in GB or for the, the CRU in the Republic, the equivalent regulator. They both have decarbonization as part of their remit. And um, we see that that's something that would have to change here in the, regula in the utility regulator's remit to allow that knock-on effect uh, downstream for connections. Yeah. Thank you. I'll probably I'll lose more questions, but other members have questions, so I'll not hog the today. But I think one of the issues I've looked at how the Scottish Government are approaching this, and they've uh, announced yesterday there's going to be a Minister for Net Zero. So by ending the silo working and actually collaborating together on the focus, and I think that's required here in Northern Ireland. But that's all my questions here today, Mr. M uh, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair, and, and gentlemen, you're very welcome to the committee. Um, just a couple of points. I would agree with Mr. Muir, but uh, we're, we're going through the climate change bill as well. And I mean, it, it, this is a cross departmental effort. I mean, if we're serious about tackling climate change and moving away from fossil fuel use, I mean, I think there's a number of ways uh, uh, and a number of departments involved. But, Mark, just listen here, we're, we're eight and a half years out from the ban on the fossil fuel, new, new, uh, new cars. And I mean, the thing is that, you know, we have a regressive network in terms of, of the infrastructure, but also that would be a big regression if people are thinking to go back to news cars. I mean, that, that would be a regressive step. So it's very concerning to hear that. I mean, if you take it, and I've met yourselves, I know there's been an increase last year in particular, a 82% increase in the registered vehicles, low, low emission vehicles. So, and that's, that's to be welcome. But I mean, in terms of the network itself, do you think it's deterring people from you know, maximising our potential for EVs? Is, is that is not one of the main factors at, at present? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, uh, if you came um, into our group at the moment um, and you were a potential uh, EV buyer, that you would definitely uh, be, be put off, you know, because of the stories that are out there. And um, as one of those quotes that I talked about, where the, the lady had a, a leaf and there are now less chargers than when, when she got her car two years ago. You know, I think the latest uh, government figures show that, that our network shrunk 19% in the last quarter. That's the official government figures. We have the, the important rapid chargers the guys have mentioned, the ones that can sort of fill the car up from not to 80% in as, as little as 25 minutes. We have 17 of those in Northern Ireland. Um, that, that works out at 1.1 chargers per 100,000 of our population here. And by comparison, Scotland have 10 per 100,000 of the population, so 10 times. But it's actually worse than that because half of those chargers are currently out of order. So it's more like 20 to, 20 to 1 comparison with Scotland at the moment. So we're, we're so far behind here. And as Darren says, you know, if we, if we could just do one thing in the morning, it would be to get us back up, get the network back up to where we were and let, let the rest follow. But that, that would be such a, you know, a huge benefit to everyone if, if we could at least get that initial step done and, and get things back online. So, so based on what you said, Mark, in terms of the rapid charges, I mean, with the modern EVs, I mean, they're just not up to standard to keep to keep those on the road. I mean, I mean, in percentage terms, how far down the road are we in terms of of, of keeping up to standard with the modern EVs in particular? Uh, what do you mean in terms of range? In terms of the rapid charger speeds, 
Well, that's all okay, speed, yes. So 50 kilowatts is, uh, are the charges that we have here. And as I say, we, we've heard we're actually meeting the east border region this evening. Um, but we've heard on the grapevine that the, the indirect um, project is going to be 50 kilowatt chargers again, which seems um, a bit of a backward step too. Now, we also hear that maybe this project was started three years ago or more, and, and, and that may have something to do with that. But, you know, chargers uh, in GB are more like 150 to 350 kilowatts now. Uh, as batteries have got bigger, that 25-minute recharging from not the 80% we want to try and keep there. So, you know, battery sizes have doubled or tripled in the last few years. So we need our charger speeds to double or triple to, to keep that 25-minute uh, charge up. Otherwise, larger battery cars are going to be sitting there for an hour and a half, and that's the charger tied up for an hour and a half, you know, and or what we'd like to see two or three cars and three at that stage. Technology in general is advancing. You know, uh, some of the latest cars can put on, I think it's 100 kilometres in five minutes, uh, which is around 60 miles in five minutes. You know, so technology is always improving, and um, we would certainly like to see the, those rapid charger speeds ramp up. There are issues around NE networks there as well. I think we've talked to them and asked them about those 17 sites that we have in Northern Ireland at the minute. Could they be easily upgraded? Uh, to 100, 150, and the answer was no there, that, you know, it's going to be major work even to upgrade those above 50, because that's pretty much the capacity of the supply at those locations. Just in terms of, I know we're focused in the north, I mean, in terms of how we compare with the south, have we been left behind here, or, or where are we? Um, Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the, the South, because they've turned on the pay to charge, they now have a something of a business case. And you know there are charging hubs starting to be built down there. You know, like a fuel station where there might be five or six rapid chargers. Um, you know, areas like motorway service stations and, and things like that. So yes, we're basically we are we are watching the network dissolve in front of our eyes here. You know, there's been zero investment. Uh, for years now, so it's certainly something that we would like to see the, the committee uh, and the department uh, would be involved in, if, if possible. If, if, I could just add, if, sorry, sorry. Al, if I could just add to the end of that, it, it might seem a bit odd that you know owners of electric vehicles are lobbying to pay for the electric that they want to use, but th that is the vast majority of the feedback that we get from our members. They, they want to pay for it, they see it as the only way forward that makes this scalable. So, you know, it does seem odd that we're lobbying to turn off free charging, but it, it's the only way forward. Okay, and just a final point, Chair. I mean, obviously ESB is a big part to play in all of this. And I mean, I know I've asked the Minister a number of cases about funding. Um, and maybe we'll have a chance in the, in the next uh, briefing to, to ask those questions. But I mean, in terms of ESB, if they don't get the match fund, I mean, what's the implications of that? Clearly, they're the ones that, that can provide the service. Um, what's your views on that? Mark, do you want to take that one? So, yeah, look, I guess we, we've had meetings with them as well, and, and we've said, look, turn on the, you know, the, take the payments. I guess there's a reluctance on, on their part because of the reliability of the network. You know, they say, how could we market this when we have so many charging points that are out of commission and the equipment is aging? And so they're even having trouble getting spare parts for it. So, you know, I guess from my point of view, I look at it as you have a business model, but you're giving away your product, you know, and that's costing you money. So that is money that you could be spending on buying, investing in new equipment, putting in new services, improving the reliability of the network. So look, we're all for um, them taking uh, payment for charging and, and put it, taking that money and investing it into the network. And, and do you think, Mark, that's the best way of getting the funding in through ESP, much funding? Yeah, yes, I think, you know, as a group, we've identified that as the single first thing that we would all like to see. You know, get, getting the existing network back on, on track is, is the only way forward. And you know, there, there are issues out there that are putting off uh, competition. You know, as Ronan has explained, the, the connection charges and, and all these things that are going to take years, as we say, rather than months, change, change the utility regulators' remit and changes for NIE network. So we need to bypass all that. We, you know, we, we've, we've almost tripled EV sales here uh, last year compared to 2019. We have lots of new people who've looked at a map and seen, oh, there's loads of chargers around Northern Ireland, bought a new electric vehicle, and the first three chargers they've gone to don't work and they're devastated, you know. So uh, we, we just need to, to get that initial uh, 
much funding for ESB. You know, they have, they have received that in, in the south and they've received that in the three cities that they've worked in in GB as well. So we're not asking for something here that they haven't had previously. Um, and we just need to find a way to get that funding for them. They, they, they talk around, um, around 750,000 to 1.5 million. That, that's the sort of uh, money that, that they're looking for and they'll put the other half in. Well, well, thank you very much for the presentation. We look forward to working with you. Said, I mean, ho hopefully we'll, we'll we'll make rapid progress. Let's say um, we're looking forward to the uh, to the next presentation. But no doubt we'll meet again. Thank you very much, Shane. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation so far. I just want to go through some of the figures, gentlemen, regarding to you referred to Northern Ireland one point one charging devices per 100,000. And if you refer that against Scotland, what's that like for mm -hmm. cars? So what's our charging network like based on, let's call Northern Ireland, it's approximately 4,000 cars, am I right in saying? So what's that like in, in the Scotland model, charging per car, not per population? Roland, you know. So we don't, I don't have a specific figure for, um, for Scotland, but I know in UK wide, the um, the there are what was the figure again, Mark? Sorry, how many? There, there we have a, a disproportionately low number of EVs yes. in Northern Ireland. There are around there are around half a million plug-in vehicles in in the whole of the UK at the moment. Um, Northern Ireland has roughly 2.8 percent of population. So pro rata, that would mean we should have around 14 or 15 thousand EVs here. Uh, latest figures are 4,700. Yeah, so we, we have about a, a third of the number of vehicles you would expect us to, to have um, based on that UK-wide figure. So even if you, you take that into account, um, assuming Scotland is, is broadly the, sa the same as, as the rest of GB, uh, that 1.1 that figure compared to the, the, the 15 in Scotland is still one-fifth of what they have in Scotland. And that's not taken into account. Those rap that's for rapid chargers, those rapid chargers that don't work. Um, and as well as that, a lot of our rapid chargers are of a design that isn't really compatible with most modern EVs. They're not capable of CCS charging. So for example, um, my car takes CCS rapid charging. I can't charge it at a lot of those rapid chargers at a fast speed. I have to use it as if it were a fast charger, which means I only get 11 kilowatts rather than the the 50 that it's supposed to. Okay, thanks for that. And you see in your little graphs here, um, your bar charts, should I say, you're showing a total charger network in Northern Ireland, let's call it 280, I'm guessing it there, total working and approximately 100 not working. So what have we got with roughly, what, 380, 400 chargers in Northern, uh, Northern Ireland with 100 of them, let's say a quarter not working? <clears throat> yeah, I think we've got 300 and, I think it's 160 uh, double-headed uh, AC chargers, so around 320 of the fast chargers, and then around 17 of the rapid chargers. So you see the double-head, do you call that a single charger, or do you call that a double charger? Is that two yeah, chargers or one? That's two chargers, yeah, we'd refer to that as two. Okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. So, fair enough. Okay, um, just a couple of other sort of tactical questions. Um, with respect to your batteries and charging them, whether you use a slow charger, fast or rapid, does that affect the life of the battery? So if you use if you use the if you were to charge your car entirely using a rapid charger, and we're talking a proper rapid charger like the 150 kilowatt, 200 kilowatt rapid chargers, if you were to do that exclusively you would have a detrimental effect on your battery. But the amount, it's very, very rare that certainly here, it would be, even if we had them, it would be extremely rare that you'd be doing that all the time. If you charge your car, as most charging will always be done at home um, as it is now. But even if you're using those, those fast chargers and the rapid chargers all the time, um, you're not going to have a significant impact on your battery. The, the modern batteries are, de are designed with safety margins. Um, Unless you're doing a long journey all the time, you might not charge your car 100% all of the time, which will also help extend the life. But we're, the, 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 the original EVs that came on stream 10, 
10 or more years ago are still on the road. The batteries are small by modern standards, but the, the vast majority of them still have 70, 80 percent of their original capacity, and that's 10 years on the road with technology that's behind what we have now. So millions of millions of miles is possible from from batteries without much difficulty. Yeah, there was there was a fear of that uh, many years ago, and the first cars came out. That's why the, the first cars, electric cars, came out with came with leases on the batteries, so that you have some level of protection. That has long since disappeared now. That the, there is no manufacturers doing leases anymore, uh, except on second hand cars that already have the leases in place. That is because the evidence has shown that the batteries will outlast the, the physical elements of the car. Um, per, and then you provide that unless you're charging to 100% every single day on a rapid charger, which could lower your, your percentage uh, state of charge. But that's a, an extremely rare scenario where that might happen. That does, and most people would just charge the 80% in that 20 minutes on a rapid that Mark talks about, and that keeps the health of the battery safe. And the cars are set up to, to do that as well. So. So, and even those batteries that... Sorry. Uh, even those Sorry. batteries that are um, finished in cars still have applications elsewhere in, in, store, in like energy storage schemes, etc., where the, the weight versus storage capacity isn't as much of an issue anymore. Yeah. Do, do you see the, was it 80% you referred to of uh, additional uh, electric vehicles last year purchase? Is that correct, 80%? Is that the figure you said? Of an, uh, you know, additional cars? Two two hundred and eighty percent increase in EV sales in Northern Ireland based uh, on the previous year. We went from about five hundred and eighty EVs to sixteen hundred odd last year. So what what has dr dr uh, driven that increase based on the let's call it per charging network? And if you ask those people that bought those cars, uh, have they made a mistake? And I'm purely referring to a bad net charging network. You know what has driven that so quickly? D Darren can probably tell you a little bit about that from what his work particularly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the incentives there um, are the a the running costs of electric cars. People are becoming more aware of that. But probably the benefit in kind um, for company cars and lease cars, three companies, particularly in the health service where we have access to a, an organisation wide lease scheme. Uh, that's where I get my car through. The benefit in kind is zero percent, rising to one percent, rising to two percent over the next two years. That is a massive change from an internal combustion engine. And I know certainly in my work, I, I work in the health service uh, at the Ulster Hospital in the Dáil. Uh, and in one month, you would see 40 cars, new cars, coming in by owners. And it's a self-perpetuating thing. The more people see more of these cars coming in, the more tend to come in. We, we, I would take people, whenever you were allowed to do this, I would take people to run in my car. They would see, my goodness, this was fantastic. Uh, and want to get in on it and then see the costs through these schemes like that with benefit and kind being so low. Plus, we're very fortunate in the health service that we also, most of the, the locations have workplace charging as well. So we have, we can charge at home and at work. Um, so that, that's very fortunate as well. So look, the benefit and kind is probably the single biggest incentive at the minute that has led to an increase. But there is disincentives there. It could have been a lot more if the charging network. I mean, we've we'll talked about uh, some of the, the items that, the, and it's on your decarbonisation strategy about the, you know, the cost of the vehicle, range anxiety and charger uh, issues are the main things. Range anxiety really isn't the issue anymore. You know, the cost of vehicles are coming down, not fast enough, you know, but the, that, that will change as, as, the, as the industry changes. Range anxiety has been replaced by charger anxiety. And that's where the range issues are because you can get to a charger, you can charge, and your range doesn't become a problem. Um, so that's the charger anxiety is the main thing that's holding things back at the moment. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson? Um, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation. I have raised my concerns about the deficits um, that we have in the charge points network in Derry. And, you know, what limited charge points uh, there are in Derry, uh, they are routinely broken down, as you would know, and in need of repair. And, of course, just listening to you, it's important, and we're all on the same page, to promote uh, sustainable transport and the decarbonisation of the public transport service. But given the, the charge point network is literally falling apart, um, like you, I'm not wanting, and we're not wanting to simply fix what is broken and then hail it as a success. 
uh, so that we can go back to the future where we were 10 years ago. So we need a strategy and we need a plan to expand on the infrastructure and to future proof um, our charge point network as well. Now, in your briefing, you pointed uh, out statistics indicating that there were 71% of all car journeys or all journeys done was done so by car. So could you elaborate on the connectivity implications? You know, if our charge point network, say, for instance, has fallen apart, as we all agree, I think, and even listening to you today, anyone, any impartial observer uh, would concur that with, with that view. But if our network doesn't get turned around without the ambition that you have talked about, um, I'm concerned around the Northwest. I'm concerned about tackling regional inequalities uh, if we can't service EVs. So could you elaborate on maybe any concern or other ways that you might have around connectivity implications? Ruin. Well, there's a there's a real uh, there's a real reputational risk now as well. Like we we as we said, we conducted a survey of our members earlier this year, and fifty eight percent of members said that they were considering going back to petrol and diesel. Um, That's they, they love their they love their EVs, but they just it's it's the stress and anxiety of trying to charge and everything is putting people off. So yes, there there is a real risk. Um, there's a real risk that it won't be possible here to uh, ban the sale of fossil fuel vehicles by 2030. But the thing is, at that stage, there won't be that many of them on the market. So we'll be stuck in a place where people only have the option or only see themselves having the option of buying fossil fuel cars, but they are actually more expensive because everybody else is driving electric vehicles. And we just don't have the infrastructure for that here. So that that's a real concern. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, suppose, I suppose listening to you all today in the presentation that you gave and the information that you had sent to us, you know, if you were keen to buy an EV, if if that was possible with within the, um, you know, with, within your own the, the money that you had, if you felt you could make a you could make such a contribution if you want to make uh, to decarbonisation um, of the of the transport system. Then you know the stress and anxiety of getting from A to B. It's it's not a great marketing sale. So you know when you said it may be impossible to ban the sale by twenty thirty, I think that's really alarming for us. And previously you said called for a cross departmental task force. Now some of my colleagues have already mentioned uh, this around cross departmental. So just to provide some focus on on that issue, could you because it's clear that the, the issues that your association has highlighted are cross-cutting and they include the Department of Infrastructure and the Utility Regulator, regulator as well as uh, NIE networks. So are you engaging with all of those, but are the officials and the minister, for instance, the DFI minister, working with you to give you confidence that the DFI will take the lead on this because we all need someone to take a lead when there's uh, problems like this that need to be addressed? I think going go um, back there um, to the charging, you know, uh, as I said, there are maybe as many as 40% of people in Northern Ireland live in dwellings that don't have off-street parking. So that, that's a big issue for the people that do have off-street parking and can uh, install their own home charger. And in many cases, they're fine. You know, you can leave your home every day. If you have a 200 mile range car, you can leave your home every day with 200 miles in your tank. Uh, so to speak. So um, it, it isn't everyone, you know, that's affected here. But certainly, if you don't have off street parking, I would say, you, you know, an EV is very difficult for you at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we have engaged with NIE several times on the utility regulator. Um, we've had great meetings with, with those organisations. NIE seem particularly NIE networks, as you say. Uh, are particularly worried, I would say, about the pace of change here. Um, you know, in some of our meetings, have said that you know if we don't get going on the on that now, to ne next year's too late. You know, if, if we're going to get to 2030, we must start now. Enough talking, time for action, and we we, we would echo that as well. I think you know, as an organisation, we've we've been talking to people since 2016, and we've really seen things go backward from there. Um, probably we took a strategic decision earlier this year to to ramp up our lobbying. Um, and try and raise awareness of this issue. Um, and ho hopefully, meetings like today uh, have, have come around uh, because of that. And, and again, thank you to the committee for having us today. 
No, thank you. Thank you for coming in the presentation. Just one issue, Chair, the last one, and it's it's probably what was touched upon earlier about some potential low-hanging fruit. Now, it might seem a contradiction given that the network has fallen apart on the one hand, but on a, a, a point that your association had previously pointed to, it was a potential quick win for both spaces uh, to be painted green at all charging points. And you had said that this could double the availability of our existing infrastructure, you know, if it were working overnight, of course, uh, which is not, and it's, it, we cannot, the pace of change, I agree with you, the pace of change here in the north and a lot of things is too slow, but we certainly need ambitious, ambition uh, injected into this. So, however, you, when you previously said, said that you were unaware of any progress on this issue, in relation to perhaps uh, both spaces being painted green. Uh, do you know if there has been any change uh, to this approach? So I can give you an example uh, there uh, of one space. We had a, a lady who contacted us about a space in County Down, um, and we wrote to DFI Roads, um, I think, in February 2020. Um, a year later, we got a, a letter to agree to it in principle, um, and that letter then said that it now has to enter... Um, uh, consultation with the police and changes in legislation and that that's uh, usually a minimum of a year uh, from now so that will be two two and a half years to get this one space painted green so we contacted the minister and asked if there was a way to batch process these or try, try and speed this all up and i have talked to uh, dfi officials in, in the last few weeks um, but apparently the problem, one of the problems here is that a lot of these chargers in the initial rollout were on private gra ground and on council car parks. So uh, DFI aren't able, you know, DFI can make the change on street, but you know, maybe as little as 20% of these chargers are on street. The rest are on hotel car parks, uh, retail car parks, um, that, that sort of thing. So like all these things we've come across, there's no e easy answer. Um, um, but we, we'd certainly love to get involved here any way we can um, to, to try and speed this up. I think you know, this is where we need this cr uh, cross-party, cross-department approach, you know, and some over overriding group uh, that brings stakeholders like ourselves together, you know, and we could, we could get a lot, of, uh, a lot of work done if the political will was there. Yeah, I think that's something that the committee can discuss around across departmental task force led by uh, the minister in terms of uh, DFI, but trying to ensure that there's also built into a co-design so that organisations and associations like yourself are engaged with and shape what needs to what, what needs to happen going forward, because you have certainly brought forward not just identifying problems, but have brought forward solutions. So thanks for the presentation and for the information you sent to us, and hopefully that this will help move things along. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs Kelly. Thanks very much. Just a very brief question, and thanks for your presentation. And I might come across as a rather stupid question, because I don't know. Uh, but in terms of the chargers being universal, not only across these islands, but across Europe, you know, is that is that the situation that we're looking at, or are we going to have to cart around different adapters with us, like I said, as if we're going on those blessed days and holidays, yeah. whenever you to bring about two or three chargers with you? <laughs> there are a couple of standards, maybe, Mark, do you want to talk about CCS being the new standard there? Yeah, the, the original cars and uh, most of the network that was deployed 10 years ago had a, a standard called Chidemo, which is a, a large connector that you, you plug into the, the front of the car. Um, uh, technology has changed from that, and uh, there's now another standard called CCS, and that's what we're saying is the more common standard in the, the modern cars. And basically, it can uh, cater for much faster charging speeds, um, and that's what we're saying. And it's already been referred to the, the 17 chargers that we have, not all of those are equipped with CCS. So I guess over time, we will see that Chidemo standard being phased out and uh, most cars now coming with the CCS standard. So hopefully we won't have all those different connectors that you have to carry around in your boot to, to <laughs> cater. Um, and that is a, that is a European-wide standard. Yes. You know, that, that, that's not just uh, UK and Ireland, that, that's across Europe and, and the rest of the world, all the car manufacturers are in on a, um, a uh, committee that, that signed off that standard so that, that everyone's working towards it. Tesla, who make cars in America, their cars now come with CCS on them. So it's, that is definitely the way forward. Well, I'm delighted to hear that and I'm somewhat relieved, I have to say, Chair. <laughs> okay. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Kimmins. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, just a couple of questions from, from myself. See, in your conversations with the ESB and the department, um, do you think that there is a strategic gap for planning our charge point network? Um, it's just every time we ask the department about charge points to tell us that ESB is responsible, but it just it seems that there's clearly struggles with keeping up, just keeping up maintaining the network. I know, and others have mentioned as well, in my own constituency in your ARMA, I'm constantly getting issues about charge points not working and things like that. Um, and I know that's been discussed, but you know, I, I, I also share the concern with the fact that none of the 11 councils have applied for any of the, the 20 million funding for the on-street uh, charge point scheme. So it was just even to get a wee bit of feedback on that and why maybe you think that it hasn't been taken advantage. You think that the, the department could have done more to kind of show a bit of leadership and, and to work with councils to encourage them to apply for that funding? Yeah, so I think, you know, in, in, in most of our engagement with stakeholders, um, all roads lead back to DFI. You know, in, in almost every case, it seems to lead there. Um, ESB and DFI between them hold, hold the levers here that, that, you know, that, that can fix all this. Um, DFI do, in, in assembly questions, they always seem to reply that, that the network is the responsibility of ESB and, and point us towards Dublin. Though, as far as I know, DFI still are involved in eCars NI. Um, so there's a bit of an identity crisis there, possibly. Um, Darren can maybe talk about what, what the, the other uh, developed governments have, you know, in, in, their, uh, in, in regards to uh, decarbonisation in their transport uh, departments. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it just a cursory look at, at the other departments' transport, transport for development as a headline directorate, low carbon economy, and, and that is about promoting the uptake of ULEVs and, and chargers. Obviously, there's OZEV, uh, the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. Uh, in, in in England, part of the Department of Transport in Wales, there's also a part of the Transport for Wales. They have a, a Department for Environment, which is decarbonising and, and a focus on that. But and in in the South, Department of Transport have a Public Transport Sustainability and Climate Change Department focused in this area. Um, now, but if you look at, at the responsibilities for DFI, there it's listing what is it like 15 to 16 different responsibilities. None of them specifically around decarbonisation, which is you know it, it stands out as, as a difference. Now that this this comes back to resource. I, I think there there needs to be more resource and DFI focused on this area that will take a leadership and start to create the conditions for taking us forward. Like we said you know DFI all roads back lead back to DFI, but it's for it's not to fix everything. It's to provide some leadership direction and create the conditions where this can be taken forward. So you know we're we're. We're pointing at DFI in some ways, but we're also looking to support DFI. They saying they need more resources focused on this, and we're one of the stakeholders that's willing to, to help in that area. Yeah, well, we'd wonder how many staff, for example, DFI have in this area. You know, can, can we get more resources into that department? And also to, to say just that we, we think this is quite like fibre broadband, for example, you know, where the government helped the rollout of fibre broadband. We're in the early stages here where it's hard to identify business models and, and uh, we really need uh, public sector involvement here to, to try and break this chicken and egg cycle. Yeah, no, that's what exactly what I was going to say. This, in terms of the broadband, it is a very much a chicken and egg situation where you have to go where the demand is, but you can't create demand until you have it there. So I, I, I totally take on board that. Just in relation to the, the new charge points saying coming from the Interreg project, and it is very much welcome news, but it's disappointing, I suppose, that will only be completed by March next year, or 20, 2023, sorry. Um, and when we put that to the Minister, she had stated that the responsibility for delivery rests and with the consortium led by the East Border Region Group. So I just I take it delivery doesn't have to be this long and because this wasn't the average delivery time for installing chargers. Um, and I think it'd be more impactful when you look at the state as as I've previously mentioned of the current network. Um what do you think then would be the implications of that kind of prolonged delivery and, and is there anything we could do to, to try and speed that up? Well, as I said, um, we're we're meeting East Border Region just tonight, actually, for the first time. Uh, they're one of the stakeholders that we identified, um, and it's taken a while just to set up a meeting there. Um, we, we've heard from a third party source that it's 50 kilowatts. We're not even sure of that, but yet it seems disappointingly long uh, period of time. You know, especially with the urgency that we have here. Again, we'd like to know the locations of, of these chargers. Um, 
20, the rumour is 20 to 23 and, and possibly two per council region um, you know, would, would give us 22. So it sounds like uh, that, that's what it's going to be. Um, but uh, as yet, we, we, we have no information really other than on, uh, what we've heard in the grapevine. Um, I think it has to go to tender as far as I know. ESB may end up be, being the, the operator. You know, I'd assume that they will, they will put in a, a tender for it. So... Um, <coughs> Perhaps that can be rolled into the, the, the orcs thing as well. I'm not really sure. The orcs thing, um, the problem there is that uh, the council, or the orcs grant can only be applied for by local authorities, uh, councils. In GB, the local authorities have jurisdiction for on street, but as we all know, they don't have here. So we're in this strange situation where the council must apply, then DFI holds control over where they can site the chargers. There is some scope to put them in uh, car parks that are near residential areas that, that have no off-street parking. Um, again, talking to OZEV and the Energy Saving Trust, they talk about a car park that's within five or 10 minutes walking distance from a, a residential area without uh, off-street parking. But even that throws up another issue. You know, we talked to Derry London Derry Council and they had identified a car park, but um, it's, um, pay and display car park so they're saying to us again we need to talk to dfi because how can a resident park in this car park overnight without paying and displaying you know they need to park there for seven hours or whatever overnight so it's back to dfi again so there are so many nuances here you know that, 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 that yeah. need to be solved yeah and what do you say there it's two charging points per council area the, again, on the grapevine, you know, we're, we're just saying that, that it's more than more than twenty uh, DC rapid chargers coming uh, from the interreg project. Um, we we wanted to know was that just in the border region, um, but we, we've been told by an early contact with uh, one of the people in the, in the marketing department of the East Border Region that it's probably going to be more like uh, two per, per council area. Okay. Okay, no, it, it, it does seem very complicated. Lots of red tape anyway, I suppose, that, that are going to make it difficult. And I suppose on my last point, it's just in relation to the, the decrease in grant funding from the British government for purchasing EVs. Um, and it's obviously going to make it less feasible for some people to purchase them. So, you know, what would your concerns in relation to that be? And, and like, I mean, for me, it's, it seems like the, I would, have worried, would be worried then about the British government commitment to making them EVs more accessible for everyone. And I mean, just to get your views on that. Yeah, I think it, it seemed early days for that. Um, Roland, maybe you want to talk about that? Yeah, it, it certainly seemed premature and, and as well. It not only was it premature, but it was a very sudden decision to the extent that people who had already ordered vehicles and were due to be delivered a vehicle in, within a coming, the coming day suddenly had to find a couple of extra thousand pounds to, to cover the cost. So yeah, as Mark suggested, it, it's too soon, we think, for that. We, we understand, yes, absolutely, in the long run, they have to pay for themselves and they will. The price is coming down every year. There are more models coming onto the market every, every month at this stage. But um, but we think it's important to that the, the, this transition is so important that it, it needs to be supported and it needs to be done the right way and to be scaling back these grants so drastically so so soon in the process is is getting too far ahead of ourselves. Yeah. No so we've, okay. Sorry, we've heard that the um, grant for uh, chargers at home will end next April as well. I'm not sure whether that's correct or not, but um, we're members of the. Uh, Alliance of EV Associations for uh, UK and Ireland, um, and that's certainly been discussed there. That, that uh, the English uh, EV Association have heard that that, that uh, grant will stop next year. And the, the loss of that grant actually poses a problem for NIE networks, because that is one of the the main mechanism that they find out how many chargers, how many um, home chargers have been installed, and helps them plan plan the needs of the, the electricity distribution system. So if, you lose, if they lose that grant, then they'll lose sight of what's happening in terms of EV charging, which is a problem as well. Quite often yeah. listen to uh, sort of American uh, stories on, on EVs and, you know, they would have a federal grant and then a state grant as well. And that's something I always think we could consider, you know, that, that, that there are national grants here, but there's nothing to stop Northern Ireland uh, doing the sort of thing that Scotland does and, and topping that up or for adding on or particularly like the, the interest-free loan um, and I think you know with interest rates at the moment that that's probably 
uh, quite an easy win uh, for the executive. Yeah. Yeah, and compared to a lease scheme, that that is the equivalent of a grant in some respects. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Thanks very much. And I mean that is quite concerning because obviously we're trying to move towards. Um, you know, zero carbon and all of that. And, and these are actually putting barriers up to, to try and do that. Um, and again, it goes back to Mark, your point around that chicken and egg situation that less people are going to try, are, are going to move then to, to electronic vehicles if there's going to be barriers like this put up. That would be my sense of it anyway. Um, but no, thank you very much um, for, for your answers. I think that'd be very, very useful and um, look forward to continuing to work with. So thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Banks. Uh, hello, hello. Oh dear. Sorry, Roy, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? We can, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks for your presentation and indeed for forming the Electric uh, Vehicle Association of Northern Ireland, um, giving a reason voice uh, to electric vehicle users. You've highlighted the problems, but uh, you've also suggested very practical solutions, many, uh, which I think should be taken up quickly. Um, UK is aiming for a carbon net zero, as is the, the EU. Frankly, I find it embarrassing that uh, there is a failure uh, on a cross cutting issues like this uh, uh, to act. I mean, I mean, clearly, a number of departments have a, a role to play. Uh, and it's vital that uh, Northern Ireland starts to move in this direction because it's coming down the line and the sooner it starts, the better. Um, now, in terms of repairs to uh, the existing uh, network, um, uh, I'm just trying to clarify, what is actually stopping uh, it, it being operational? Cause, because this is one of the things which is, as you say, gives comfort that if someone misjudges their their their, their travel capacity, they have an option to recharge. So um, certainly the fact that it's given out free means nobody's making any money from it, so therefore there's no financial incentive to re repair it. But are there any other uh, restrictions that are preventing uh, a new modern connection being put in there? The, the, main, the main problem is that the equipment is a decade old and in many cases the, the manufacturer has gone out of business or the parts aren't available. So ESB are literally, we believe, taking parts out of these machines and soldering components onto them you know, to, to try and keep them alive. Um, they, they will not spend the money uh, you know, on, on some of these chargers are 20, 30, 40 thousand pounds. Uh, to replace. Um, now they, have, they have made a commitment to do some work this summer and they're replacing um, 30 double headed chargers, around 60 uh, AC chargers and five rapid chargers of the 17 will be replaced this summer they tell us. So they're doing that um, at their own expense but to do the complete job then they, they need this much funding they tell us. The, 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 um, is there any anything in terms of the current um, uh, tender that they may have won, which is actually stopping them putting a charge facility in and, and ensuring that people don't hog those spots? Yeah, so we, we need to, this hogging issue. We need to turn on pay to charge to solve that, um, because at the minute there's no way to uh, penalise somebody who, who overstays. So that then gets back to they, they won't do that. They won't turn on pay to charge until they have a reliable network, and then we get back to we need the money to, to upgrade the network. There was a perceived barrier to that uh, several years ago, but that was resolved by the utility regulator in 2019. Uh, Just for Marty, can you advise, are you aware if there's anything to stop um, in legislative or in terms of the conditions that they have been uh, allowed to set up their charging points to go to a billing system so that uh, that will manage, self-manage? Yes, no, so that's the, the, the bit that Roman's referring to there. there there's a maximum resale price. Um, there was legislation that said that you couldn't effectively re resell electricity on, um, but that was solved, and I think it was believed in March 2020. Um, the utility regulator uh, made, made a, a change there, so there's, there's no barriers anymore to, to holding them up. Uh, so, 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 just purely, it doesn't make economic sense for any company to put in new equipment. Is that what the barrier is at the moment? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, thanks. Thanks for that clarity. Uh, in terms of um, expanding uh, the network, um, 
uh, there is considerable cost in putting in the new connection. And I'm also aware from previous work in industry that when you have a heavy duty electrical load, there's a higher monthly tariff, if you like, for the, the availability of being able to pull into perhaps uh, 50 or 100 kVA or, or even higher. Um, so um, are you saying that, that um, to enable the network to grow, um, Sony needs to take a look at their pricing structure so that some of that, certainly the initial setup costs might be shared even temporarily to, not, to create a critical mass, which then will be self-sustaining? So this, this comes down to the, the, the distribution connection um, charge, charging by NIE networks. And yes, it's, it's that point about the, the socializing of the connection cost, or at least the partial socializing of the connection cost so that the entire cost of distribution grid reinforcement isn't passed on to whoever's looking to install the chargers. And, and that's the point that comes down ultimately to the, the remit of the utility regulator and whether or not they can allow NIE to pass that element of the cost onto the, the wider consumer as is done in, in GB and ROI and elsewhere. Okay, th th thanks for that. Uh, and then, then finally, in terms of um, uh, developing the network and, and giving greater confidence um, to electric vehicle owners, um, our, our motorway network and, and the service stations or garages that are uh, on it or, or, or surround it, um, is it being targeted in any way so that those who take longer journeys can in the future um, have a, a degree of confidence of being able to access one of these rapid chargers? Yes, definitely. Darren, do you want to talk to me about what it's like in GB now? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the direction of travel. As we've already said, there's multiple types of chargers. The, the standard, some are called slow chargers that you put at home. The what some would call destination chargers. The, the home ones are seven kilowatts for just for a size and thing. The destination chargers range between seven and twenty-two, and then there's the rapid chargers, um, which range between fifty up to three hundred and fifty. Those those are meant to be on main arterial routes uh, that people travel, uh, and that is certainly across GB and Ireland and Europe. That is the direction of travel that that, that is happening there. They're mm -hmm. putting service station BP has started to put them into theirs. Maxwell actually in Northern Ireland have, have just got a test one up in, in Antrim to, to prove this as well. That's the kind of thing that needs to happen here. Is that, that's why we'd like to influence the positioning of these 22 chargers from Interreg to make sure that they go into the correct positions um, and, and the correct locations for those. Um, so some influence for DFI on the positioning of appropriate chargers would be essential in this. Yeah. But that, you're, you're quite correct that, that, that to enable long journeys, that's where they're needed on main arterial routes, motorways, and A roads. So, sorry, just one other point that I, I, I just struck, struck me um, in terms of developing the network. Um, you mentioned that you've, you've been engaged with the Department of Infrastructure, but then there are lots of other um, people on, on private property or council property. Uh, I, I would have thought it would be worthwhile engaging with, with Nelga or all the local councils because it might actually be a very easy win to convert the one parking, sp parking space that's, that a charger can access to two. Mm -hmm. And that in itself will increase the, the viability of uh, introducing the new technology uh, and that new investment, which, which we're all seeking to get. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, no one else has indicated. Do you have anything further that you'd like to add that you don't feel has been covered in the session? No, Chair, I think we've covered well today. I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we've, we've had a really great uh, conversation this morning. And uh, again, thanks to everyone. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been very informative. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, members, if you're content, we'll move then to our next briefing from the department. And again, it's on the same theme of our okay. inquiry into the decarbonisation of road transport in Northern Ireland. Again, Hansard will record the meeting. Uh, you'll find the briefing paper from the department at page 149 of your packs. And we will um, <coughs> welcome an attending via Starleaf. We have Liz Loughran. 
the Director of Transport Policy, Jackie Robinson, and Director of Public Transport Division, Claire Cockrell, the Head of Transport Policy and Climate Change, and Chris McLean, the Head of Translink Sponsor Unit. You're all very welcome um, this morning. And I'm not sure, is it is Jackie or Liz who's... It's Liz, who's leading off. OK, Chair, thank you. Chair, I will start if that's OK. OK, that's great. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Chair, and thanks for the invitation to brief committee members on decarbonising road transport, and in particular, um, the opportunity to um, respond to your inquiry. Um, and if it's OK with you, Chair, I'm going to make a few opening remarks. We'll hand over to Jackie, who will do the same, and then um, obviously we'll answer um, members' questions. So as... Um, as you'd said, I'm the director of the FI's Transport Policy Division. I'm also um, the department's walking and cycling champion. Um, Jackie um, Robinson is the director of the FI's Public Transport Division. Um, and we're also joined by Claire, who's the head of Transport Policy and Climate Change Branch, and Chris McLean, mm -hmm. who is the head of um, the TransLink Sponsor Unit. Um, we have been doing a lot of work on decarbonisation since um, the return of the Assembly and since ministers took up post, um, and the minister is really strongly supportive of being ambitious in any actions that we take to address the climate change emergency. Um, she strongly supports a green recovery, um, and she's also committed to working in partnership with executive colleagues to help deliver the necessary changes. Um, I will, you have the briefing paper um, that we sent through, so I will just quickly outline some of the key areas of policy development which the department's taking forward. You'll get more detail within that briefing paper, um, but um, it just a sort of a quick sprint through. Um, transport's the second highest um, producer of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, here um, accounts for about 23% of emissions and about 33% of energy consumed. If we are going to be successful on decarbonisation, um, we will have to achieve efficient, cleaner energy, um, and we will also have to think very carefully about how we use that energy um, and look at um, some of our um, wider policies and look at how we travel and also why we travel. So um, the minister um, ha has had us working on the development of policy options to decarbonise the transport sector and that um, our main work on that to date has been um, working on the transport theme in, um, in development of the new energy strategy for Northern Ireland which is obviously led by the Department for the Economy. So the strategy addresses the strategic energy issues, including the um, response to climate change and the UK government's 2050 net zero carbon target. So to help with that, we've set up a working group, which it brings all the key stakeholders in. Um, so range of government, non-government and industry reps. Um, last year, um, we completed the analysis of the transport responses to the energy strategy call for evidence. Um, the call for evidence showed pretty clear support for a travel hierarchy approach. So firstly, that means focusing on measures to reduce travel, um, then promoting active travel and public transport, and finally switching to low and zero emission vehicles. Um, the response has also highlighted the need to promote the use of low emission public transport, to invest in walking and cycling infrastructure, the need to in incentivise uptake of electric vehicles, to upgrade and expand the EV charge point infrastructure, and also um, pointed out that more work was required to incentivise the use of green hydrogen, biofuels and alternative fuels for heavy vehicles. 
So we took all that information that the that had been provided by the public and by stakeholders during the call for evidence, and we use that to develop proposals, which are set out in the energy strategy options paper, which was published for public consultation at the very end of uh, sorry the very end of March. Um, and that identifies all the measures and options that we think are required to help achieve zero carbon emissions and reduce energy use across a number of sectors. So specifically on the transport side, that includes measures to promote modal shift, um, focusing on the need to reduce vehicle miles, um, encouraging active travel and use of public transport, and also exploring more place-based solutions to change the distances that people actually need to travel. Um, we've also looked then at measures to support the transition from fossil fuels to zero emission, zero emission vehicles. Um, and focusing on the next steps which will be required to achieve decarbonisation through electrification of vehicles and the use of alternative fuels. So that consultation will close on the 30th of June. We are hoping to get um, more feedback from the public on, well, firstly, whether we have picked up um, all of the key issues from the call for evidence and then secondly does this look like a logical strategy and a logical way forward as we develop the department's response so we are also conscious that on many of these issues the department does not have expertise so we have commissioned for research um, pieces which we hope will provide us with more information and more of an expert view. So those four research pieces um, are about active travel and modal shift. They're about the electrification of transport. The third one is looking at the greening of the public sector fleet. And the final one is about alternative fuels in the transport sector. So we are expecting um, the output from those research pieces within the next few weeks. We'll feed that together with the information that we have from the options consultation, and that will allow Minister Mallon then to finalise the policy options included in the final strategy. So just um, outside of the strategy, we're also um, working with colleagues across the NICS to develop work on climate change. Um, and that includes, as you'll know, the development of a multi-decade green growth strategy. Um, it, there is a lot of work in this area at the moment, and it, it's we are trying really hard to make sure that we are making the connections and making sure that the work that we're doing in one area feeds the others. So, for example, the energy strategy work on decarbonisation has a clear read across to the climate change work and um, the feedback from the climate change and the green growth we will obviously bring into our work on the energy strategy. Um, Obviously, transport's um, a devolved matter, and we are taking a lot of the policy work forward. Um, but there are also a number of areas where um, policy and legislation that's being developed at Westminster is extending to Northern Ireland in relation to vehicle transport and vehicle policy work. And that's also going to have an effect on decarbonisation. So some of it um, is headline material. So the Prime Minister's plans to bring forward a ban on the sale of diesel and petrol vehicles from 2035 to 2030. Um, and um, so we are doing work with officials in DFT and with the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles um, to understand the work that they're doing and help them understand what that means for Northern Ireland. Um, in addition to that, Minister Mallon is seeking clarity from the Secretary of State on the allocation, Secretary of State for Transport, sorry, on the allocation of funding to support Northern Ireland in our transition to cleaner, greener transport. 
Um, we're also working with Whitehall officials on the UK-wide transport decarbonisation plan to make sure, again, that the Northern Ireland context is properly represented. Um, that plan is due spring summer um, and it will address some of the strategic energy issues and it will also um, address um, responses to climate change. Um, and we intend to use the work that we're doing there to um, shape Northern Ireland's own policy. Um, so, um, again, we are looking, there's the policy work, but the minister's also looking at um, other initiatives where we can support the decarbonisation of transport. So last year, the minister announced the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund as a catalyst for, po for um, positive infrastructure and cultural change. Um, within that fund, there's a number of relevant projects which promote low or zero emission transport and reduce reliance on the internal combustion engine. Um, so that's things like investment in greenway projects, investment in walking, cycling, and other active travel investments. Um, we have procured um, as a small pilot project, um, a couple of um, electric vans to replace end of life petrol and diesel vehicles in the department. So we're running that as a pilot, hoping to learn to hoping to learn from that and to see to what extent we can roll that out across the department. If we can make it work within the department, obviously that will give them more information when it comes to rolling out across the public sector and greening the whole fleet. Um, we're also um, looking at filters to reduce emissions on the Strangford ferries. Um, I note that you've just had a... Um, presentation from uh, about electric vehicles and particularly focusing around charging. Um, so since 2010, um, we've been working to try and support the introduction of electric vehicles. Um, the, the network that was developed by the former DRD was um, commercialized in 2015, spun out to um, ESB and is now operated on a commercial basis. That's in line with um, what happened in um, in the rest of these islands. Um, as you've heard and as we're well aware, um, the commercialization um, here has seen some quite significant market failure issues. Um, there are um, it's something that needs to be addressed, but because of the commercial realities of this, we need to um, look at the market and work out what gaps the market is not going to fill, what we need to fill. Um, it's a very, it's a nascent market. It's very fast moving. Um, we need to work to make sure that we have the right number of charge points, the right type of charge points, in the right places. There are an awful lot of players on the field. Um, so that is something that's very complex that we're trying to work through bit by bit at the moment. Um, but we, um, we are working with stakeholders and also the work from the energy strategy from the working group and also the research. We are hoping that that will give us a clearer sense of the way to go on that. Um, the minister's also done other things to support the growth of the chart of electric vehicles. So she introduced changes to the planning system through um, permitted development rights that came in in December. So that's intended to make it easier to cite the um, points. Um, she's contributed the match funding for the Interreg project that you were discussing earlier, rapid transport points and she's also written a number of times to OZEV and to the Energy Saving Trust um, to administer the on-street, who administer the council um, from the on-street residential charging points. Um, firstly, to, firstly, she wanted to make sure that um, 
councils in the north could actually access the fund and then secondly um, we've had a number of discussions about the lack of uptake both with OZEV and also with the councils themselves and we're working to put um, a process in place that will support the councils in those applications. Um, just finally from me um, just in terms of ESB. We have been talking to ESB, we've been working with ESB um, to try and work out how, um, how we will work together to repair the current points, extend um, the network and make it, make it a network that is reliable enough to be chargeable. Um, there are a number of very, very significant challenges there because it's commercial. Um, we are wading through, we've taken advice from DSO um, on virus issues for the department. Um, there are also a number of state aid issues that we're trying to work through at the moment. So complex, but the minister is keen to make progress. Um, and I suppose just finally, before I pass over to Jackie, um, we're also considering the introdu introduction of a range of alternative fuels, which could replace petrol and diesel. So that's um, areas where electric will not work. Um, we're looking at things like hydrogen, compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas. And can they provide us with interim um, uh, interim solutions for decarbonizing the heavy goods sector? Um, we have a, we're part of a steering group with Belfast Met um, and the private sector on the intra hydrogen project, GenCom, um, and that has provided the platform that, for the introduction of hydrogen buses to the TransLink fleet. So on that note, it's probably an uh, appropriate time to pass to Jackie to talk more about the um, TransLink interventions. Okay, thanks Liz. Um, good morning Chair and members and thanks for the opportunity to come along and address you today. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes to provide an overview of the work being taken forward to, to decarbonise the public transport sector. So Minister Mallon has made addressing climate change one of her key priorities. She is focusing on delivering clean public transport. However, the cost of doing so will be significant. At the moment, the full cost of decarbonisation the bus and rail network is estimated at about £3 billion over the next 15 to 20 years. These figures are broad capital estimates based on prevailing market rates of fleet replacement, associated infrastructure and the electrification of the rail network. However, as technology develops, we do think that this figure will come down. Minister Mallon has already invested significantly in moving our public transport bus fleet to zero emissions. You will be aware in early 2020, she announced the transling procurement of three hydrogen buses from Wright Bus as part of the Northern Ireland Hydrogen Project that will see the first hydrogen buses and in conjunction with Energia, the first hydrogen refuelling station in Ireland. These vehicles entered into service in our public transport network in December 2020, and I know that the committee had an opportunity to view these just before they went into to service. TransLink is leading the way in relation to zero emission public transport vehicles. In addition, Minister Mallon also committed £50 million capital funding under the New Decade New Approach Agreement for the purchase of 100 zero emission vehicles by TransLink over the next two years. These vehicles will be made up of 80 battery electric buses and 20 hydrogen fuel cell buses. It's anticipated that the first of these will go into service in Belfast in spring of next year before being rolled out to Derry. These are the first steps in achieving the Minister's ambition for full decarbonisation of public transport. Minister Mallon has also outlined her ambitions for our rail network as an alternative to road-based transport and has highlighted that she is keen to do all she can to explore how we can progress real improvements within the budgetary envelope that she has available to her. In seeking to realise the untapped potential that real offers to deliver multiple benefits across our island and to address regional imbalance, 
Minister Mallon has commissioned a number of pieces of work to improve our rail network. These include commissioning feasibility studies to bring phase three of the upgrade of the Derry to Coldrain line back on track, no pun intended, while also bringing forward studies for additional halts and a half hourly service between Belfast and Derry. In regards to further expansion of our rail network, the Minister is keen to take a strategic view on how we prioritise our investment. The All Island Strategic Rail Review, which Minister Mullen announced last month, along with Minister Ryan, will allow us to consider our rail network across the island to view how we can improve it for everyone. It reflects the commitment under New Decade New Approach Agreement to examine the feasibility of high and higher speed rail connections between Belfast, Dublin and Cork. Minister Ryan and Minister Mullen also have a shared ambition for rail and commitment to tackling climate emergency. And they are keen that we use the opportunity of the rail review to consider how we can improve our rail network across the island of Ireland, including into the northwest. As a consequence, the um, remit of the review has been extended to consider the potential for interregional rail, including high or higher speed rail links to the northwest, rail connections to our international gateways, which are our ports and airports, the potential for rail freight and decarbonisation of the rail network. While these works are ongoing, Minister Mallon continues to invest with the purchase of 21 additional carriages for our rail network, and she saw the first of these being delivered in March. These carriages are 20% more fuel efficient than previous trains and will play a significant role in providing lower carbon transport when the first of these comes into commission in the autumn. Early plans are also being developed for a replacement for the cross-border enterprise fleet. And as part of that work, low emission options, including hybrid and full electrification, will be considered. So, Chair and members, thank you very much um, from Liz and I for the opportunity to present to you this morning. And we're very much happy with our team to answer any questions that you have. Okay, and thank you both for, for your presentation. Um, and as you'd heard from those who presented just prior to you coming on, they have um, concerns, I suppose, in relation to um, a number of aspects of what you've touched on, particularly around um, the, um, I suppose, the, the draft energy strategy and, and the work the department is, is undertaking. And we very much appreciate that you want to do this um, forensically and, and get as much um, data and information from, from experts in order to um, create a report which actually is meaningful. But I suppose the concerns that they would have is that this could take a considerable time then to see the art workings of it. Um, and I mean, they, they have given um, some information in relation to um, conversations that they've had with their own members where you have around 58% of those who are currently um, using electric vehicles are considering actually going back to petrol and diesel, which is, is a retrograde step um, and something which probably isn't particularly positive news um, for this committee to hear. So I suppose it's really about the time scales um, with regards to um, the, the piece of work that you're carrying out with the Department for the Economy. And also then the conversations that you're having with ESB, because another aspect of, of their concerns was in relation to the existing network and the urgency that there is to try to get it up and, and running. So can you give us a time scale for the reporting um, and also then for your engagement with ESB? And at what stage will you maybe bottom out the complexities that you're experiencing um, to look at, at other options? Okay. Um Chair, I'll, I'll sort of take the first part of that and then hand to Claire um, to talk about the detail of the engagement that's going on in the work and the timescales for that work. I suppose my, my first observation is that electric vehicles are really, really important, but they are not the most important part of this. Um, electric, there is, um, there is a lot of work to be done on journey reduction and on modal shift. Um, electric vehicles have a huge amount of embedded emissions in them, um, so they are part of the solution, but they're not the whole solution. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Claire just in terms of the timetables for those, for the work we're doing on the charging network. 
So, um, and I think as, as I said in the presentation, the, the work in, in terms of the, the research that we're, we're doing um, will be finished by the end of June. And the options paper will also be due at the end of June. And we're also expecting then some of the policy development work coming out of UK that will be finished around about at that time. So it will be a case of putting all of that together in order to inform the development of the, the, the final energy strategy, which is due to be published by the end of the year. And um, that said, um, there will be still ongoing work required. Um, so for example, one of the, the options um, put forward in the energy strategy um, options consultation is to produce um, an EV infrastructure plan. Um, so, so that would, would then follow um, working with stakeholders. And in relation to, to our, our engagement with the SBA as, as well, just to, to pick up the second part of the question, um, so we have had recent uh, meetings with, with the ESB um, and um, we understand that, that they are putting in place a, a replacement programme, which will address around about 60 of the charge points, so 30 of the, of the, the double-headed charge points um, and five rapids as well. So we, we expect that that will, will, will um, be put in place or, or, or commence very soon, um, and the minister is very keen to explore um, opportunities to to um, to provide or support um, the ESB in, in terms of, of the the existing charge point network. So um, we, we are looking at opportunities for for um, providing support within the department. As I said, it, it is complex in, in terms of the procurement rules and, and state aid issues. So we're working through those. Um, and we're also engaging with um, OZEV. And um, as I said, the minister has written to um, Whitehall ministers to get a better understanding of, of what support will be forthcoming in light of the, the, the 10 point plan and the, the ban on electric vehicles that was announced at the end of last year. Okay, thank you. And just in relation to the SEUPB project with the East Border um, region, there seems to be some confusion as to what that would mean for Northern Ireland with the, the number of, of new charging points and where they would be located. Could you give us some more information in respect of that? Um, well, the East Border region are, are leading on, on that, that work, so the department is not actually in, involved in, in the delivery of that work, um, so we've provided that funding um so um i think um EVA and i are, are due to meet with um SEUPB and, and east border region and um it would it would be the ones that are, that are taking forward um the, the delivery aspects of the project so they are best placed to, to advise on that okay and um i suppose a further point which came out of our previous briefing was in regard to um if, whether there's any consideration being given to a cross departmental task force because we are very mindful of the fact that this is this isn't just doesn't fall just within your remit or within the remit of um the department for the economy um i'll take that one chair i mean what we have tried to achieve with the transport working group is is um, something that is both cross departmental, cross departmental, and cross sectoral. Sitting under that are a number of um, thematic groups. Um, so it, it's not just about the departments. It, we have tried to bring in certainly the private sector and other players here. Um, again, because of the commercial nature of a lot of this. Um, so. I, the minister is not considering a task force at the moment because that working group is bringing the stakeholders together. Um, in terms of the next steps after the, um, as the energy strategy is developed, that's something that we would consider as we reflect on what's come back in from the options consultation and as we develop the strategy for moving forward. But the answer is not at the moment, Chair. Okay, and just very finally for me, um, your, the, option, the options consultation document, um, how are you going about that consultation process in order to maximise the, the, you know, I suppose the best um, engagement with, with stakeholders? Okay, the consultation has been led by um, the Department for the Economy and we have been um, inputting into their um, plan um, on the when we did the work around the call for evidence we ran some specific transport um, workshops um, and we would be looking to um, look at similar transport specific engagement this time i don't know if claire you have anything you want to add to that 
Yes, the Department for the Economy are, are currently organising some stakeholder events, um, and it would, would cover the the um, the, the different um, elements of the energy strategy. So um, we would be feeding in, into that process, um, and I think they're hopefully going to take place um, in the next number of weeks, so mid June time. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Kimbins. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all the, the speakers. Um, just a couple of points on the, I suppose, on the electric vehicles issue, and obviously we've had the briefing related to that um, prior to this one. Um, it indicated about the Minister was engaging with the, the DR Minister and the, and the Economy Minister in terms of how they can work together to encourage greater use of electric vehicles. Can you give us any more detail on the outcome of, of those engagements? Um, at the moment, um, there have been a number of discussions um, and there has been some um, work, some work that there's been some work done within DFI about um, what, um, about how the, how the departments might work together to encourage this and deliver this. Um, what we're re what we're really waiting for on this is some more of the information from the research projects, um, because one of those research projects is designed to help us look at what sort of charging infrastructure do we need, um, what what does it what is what is the right infrastructure, right place, right time, what are the right sort of charging points. So once we have that um, information, that will um, Give us that will allow us to have a more informed conversation, particularly with the DERA minister, in terms of how we might work together to deliver some of that infrastructure. And I don't know if you'd, you'd heard the points, Liz, around um, that I'd made around the, the, the funding from the British government decreasing for charging. Um, has there been any scope or any discussion around the possibility of the, the, the ministers looking at top up grants or anything like that, which may help to? To reduce the barriers now, which we, you know, obviously the chair mentioned there about a, a retrograde step, and yeah. uh, people are starting to think about moving back to petrol and diesel cars because of the issues with charging points. So, is that is that forming part of any of the discussions that have taken place so far? Okay, the minister has written to um, the department, the secretary of state for transport, about funding um, some of the. Sorry, I caught, I caught kind of the last fifteen minutes, so I, I'm not sure <laughs> I have all of your questions. Um, but um, certainly, the sense that some of these programmes um, were coming to an end is not something that the FT have told us. Um, so the minister is still very much trying to um, ensure that Northern Ireland gets its fair share on this um, and that OZEB are properly engaged with interests here. Um, the, there is um, significant amounts of money available at the moment um, that actually we're not applying for. So I think our focus is more particularly um, particularly, for example, with the councils in can we find a way to support the councils to access that money rather than putting extra money in um, from um, the department? Yeah, no, no, that's, and I suppose that's one of the points that I'd raised as well about the lack of uptake from, from the level councils. And, and I think there, does, there certainly is a role for the department to, to be showing some leadership and trying to to encourage them to do that. The point I just made there was was in relation to the grant funding for purchasing um, electric vehicles and how that they've said it was being decreased. And, and what had we said in the last briefing was the possibility of the um, the department and, and it may be in conjunction with economy and era looking at is there any potential for us to provide a top up here in the north that may help to offset some of that. So it's just to raise that point. Um, just on, on a couple of other things, Liz, regarding active travel, mm -hmm. um, the department is continuing to construct shared pathways for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, but I know that best practice suggests that segregated cycle paths, paths um, should be implemented. And I know that, I suppose, in, in the past five years, over 70% of the cycle projects that have been progressed were shared uh, facilities. So it's just to ask, will the department now be moving away from shared pathways to future-proof um, mm -hmm. cycle and infrastructure? Okay, the, um, 
the best practice is actually contained in LT, it's in a practice note called LTN 1 of 20. Um, and it doesn't actually say that shared paths shouldn't be used. What it says that is we should think carefully about the use of shared path. So for example, if you are in a urban area, the presumption should always be to segregate, um, particularly in high footfall areas. In other areas, um, in more rural areas and in long stretches, particularly where there is not high footfall, um, the guidance actually suggests that we should go with shared footpaths. So I think the job for the department here is to really try and make sure that we get the balance right, that um, we don't use shared footpaths which cause conflict where there is high footfall um and i'm not um i'm not saying we've got the balance right yet i think we definitely still have work to do but just to to kind of make clear there is a place for shared paths um and that is fully in line with the guidance but we just need to be careful where we use them okay no no that's fair enough but my last point here just it's in relation to rural connectivity um and i think you know, it's important that we know how important connectivity is for everybody, but especially in rural areas where people are more dependent on cars and public transport. Um, and I suppose moving forward, we knew we need to ensure that it's actually enhanced, not jeopardised. But just to kind of get a sense of what considerations the department's given um, regarding the importance of connectivity in rural areas in the context of this and, and decarbonisation. Um, the, tra the transport plans at the moment are probably our main route for looking at individual areas and looking at the different needs of different places. Um, obviously, the mix on this for decarbonisation is going to be different wherever you are. I mean, somebody living um, sort of in and about fast will actually find it pretty easy to switch to walking and cycling. Somebody who lives um, significant distance from services, there is always going to be a requirement for a vehicle. Um, within the transport plans, um, we will work quite iteratively with the councils as they go through their local development um, um, plan process to look at making sure that what we are suggesting in transport terms fits with their local plans and the, the mix will be different it has to be different because there are just different experiences for different people okay well that's fair enough thank you um thank you chair that's me thank you mr Beggs. hello there um picking up a lot of concerns today um in terms of um what's what's happening um in particular, uh, UK is a target for 2030 and 2035 to move away from um, petrol and diesel engines and the Electrical Vehicle Association Northern Ireland are indicating mm -hmm. that, uh, that because of the uncertainty of recharging points, it is putting uh, a considerable number of people off, creating anxiety. Um, and so it appears that there's, a, there's an objective for but not, not the, the delivery on the ground to enable that to happen. And um, going to what, what you've said in your, your statement that ESB, uh, let me get the wording right, uh, they, that hopes to work, that work program will commence in the summer of 2021. Um, I would have thought we're pretty close to that now. The summer start is at the 1st of June. Um, so it, has there been a, a clear date given to you when this work will happen or are there still outstanding issues that may stop it happening? Okay, um, some of the questions around the SB are difficult for me to answer. <clears throat> this is a commercial um, proposition and there is um, there are commercial sensitivities here. As far as we are aware, um, ESB plan to start work very soon on doing uh, on doing the work they have promised, but we cannot make them do it. I think is the bottom line. We can support them. We can try and find ways to help them. I mean, this kind of comes back to where I was talking right at the beginning that. Um, there are quite serious market failure issues in here um, and issues that have not been seen 
um, in other jurisdictions across these islands. Um, and we are having to very carefully, because of the commerciality of this, step through it and try and find out, can we, um, can we identify those points of failure and work out what the department can do to move into there without actually interfering with the commercial market? And it is difficult. Um, I mean, in terms of giving confidence to people, people clearly we do not want to be in a position where people who've already made the leap to electric vehicles start to move away from them because of fears about the um charging system um the i mean modern electric vehicles um have significantly improved ranges over the last few years because obviously the technology is moving apace um we expect the majority of um charging to take place at home, but there is definitely still a role for charging um, charging, uh, charging points across the roads network, really to just give that confidence to people. Um, we are, as part of the research work that I referred to earlier, some of that will be about making sure that um, we try and build the points in the right places and that will be about building points that are commercially viable as well, because otherwise in a few years time, we're going to be back in this situation saying, well, we built points at X, Y, and Z. Um, nobody, is used, nobody is paying to charge at those points because charging at those points will be more expensive than charging at home. So therefore the commercial entity um, who is running them has no incentive to repair them. So that's why we're trying to do all of the research work now to make sure that we actually get this right. Um, <clears throat> certainly is vital that, that that's put back in place. Um, now, in terms of the interreg funding and the uh, new network that may emerge, uh, I'm surprised to say here that you, you, you're not aware of what, how it's going or... Uh, what degree of applications? Would, would you not accept that the department uh, should be looking at, at uh, in, ensuring that um, there is a strategic uh, location uh, on our uh, uh, main uh, networks that, that these location, these new charging points would be installed rather than just wait and see what the outcome is? So has the been engaging with local authorities to ensure uh, um, they be considered and hopefully Okay, we've had some um, engagement with SEDPB um, and the Eastern Border Region as well. Again, this is down to we can't tell them where to put the points. Um, so we can <coughs> offer advice, we can offer guidance, and we are doing so. Um, but the department is not, um, the department can't direct this. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you, you, need, you need to have local authorities, as I understand, to make applications. So my, my, my comment was, or our question was, have you been actively engaged with councils? Thing. Both those councils and indeed on behalf of everyone. So I'm not sure I caught all of that, but just in terms of the engagement with councils, there's kind of two sets of engagement with councils going on. There's the ones for the on street um, <coughs> residential charge points, and we are very much engaged with councils on that because that's the one where we're trying to support them to bring the money in from OZEV. On the um, SEUPB project, the Interreg project, um, we. <laughs> We are engaging mainly through SEUPB rather than directly with the Eastern Border and Region. Um, Claire, I'm not sure if there is anything that you can add just in order to give Mr. Beggs more detail around that. I, I'm, I'm not in the position at, at the moment to, to, to update on that. Um, there, there is another area of the department that are, are engaged with SEUPB, so perhaps we could come back on that. Oh, okay. Happy to receive information. Um, now, in terms of the overall balance of uh, capital investment by the department, um, 
There's still ongoing concern that the, the balance has not moved significantly enough towards uh, supporting walking and cycling routes, particularly, I have to say, in, in urban areas. Um, uh, so is there anything going on in terms of your capital investment priorities? Um, I, I kind of don't want to speak to my fi for my finance colleagues, but certainly the minister established um, the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund last year. Um, so there was £20 million put into it this year. Um, I would expect something similar to go into it this year. Um, I know that one of the minister's focuses for that fund this year is very much on looking at what can be directly directly delivered by our roads divisions in terms of um, walking, improved walking and cycling infrastructure. Um, so, I, 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 yes, the minister is looking at this. Um, I don't know what the overall balance will be, um, but there's certainly, um, I mean, on some of the preliminary figures, there is a big increase in the expenditure of the department. There is a big planned, sorry, a planned increase in expend direct expenditure from the department on the roads network and what it does for the walking and cycling provision on that network. Uh, okay, thanks for that. And in terms of uh, smart meters, um, I understand that that can play uh, an important role of, of developing um, electrical vehicle usage uh, in Northern Ireland elsewhere. So my question there is, is there cross-departmental uh, thinking discussions going on to ensure that the necessary infrastructure is put in place uh, rather than simply um, plowing your own furrow? Mm. Yes, and this this is where the um, this is where the interface with the Department for the Economy comes in because obviously there they they would lead on that, but we are talking to them through the energy strategy process. Okay, thank you. What is happening there? Reporting what we're doing. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'm conscious of time. I think we're, we're getting chucked out of the room soon. Uh, uh, thank you all for, for coming along. It's appreciated. Um, particularly, Chris, last time I saw you didn't have a beard, so things have changed over the last year. Uh, the, uh, just a couple of things. First of all, around the EV uh, charging issue. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's a key concern uh, because we're trying to encourage people to, to make the, the switch to uh, electric vehicles. So the charging network, um, well, frankly, it's a bit of a shambles, really, to be honest, mm -hmm. and we do need to sort that. <coughs> Chair touched upon this earlier, and the CBI have made a particular recommendation on a call for an EV charger task force. Um, th this is a, th what we're seeing here is silo departmental working, because we know that the Department of Economy has some responsibilities, and the Department of Infrastructure have some responsibilities. To me, the FI should be taken and leading this. Why on earth can we not get an EV charger task force to drive this forward and address these issues? Because I'm going to be really honest, I so appreciate the work that's been done around this, but I have no confidence that we'll not be sitting here in a year's time discussing the same problems in terms of a poor charger network, and we need to be able to turn that around if we're in any way credible in terms of dealing with climate change and the emergency that was declared. Okay, we have brought um, a couple of CBI nominations onto the Transport Working Group um, to pick up the, ta the task force concerns. Um, again, I suppose that at the moment I'm focused on get on trying to work through that transport working group rather than setting up a separate structure. Um, the CBI has nominated, they will attend their first, the, the next meeting will be their first meeting. Um, I have agreed um, that we will um, see how it works and if, it, if they feel it's not working, I will talk to Angela McGowan again about a different way of approaching this. But at the moment, as I say, we are trying to put all the work on this through the transport working group because that also gives us a good link with the department for the economy and pulls um, their expertise into this so that we're not um, working in silos. I just I think we need to be able to go back to people with clear clear timescales for when we're going to fix this mm -hmm. because we don't have that at the moment so when we're engaging with different people and you've got EV cars and user groups mm -hmm. 
all, all we're doing is saying we're listening to you. We need to be able to go back. Like we heard this morning around the funding for the chargers and how that potentially is going to be too for council area. Like we do need to be able to come back with something a bit more ambitious than what we have. And I, I do appreciate a lot of the work that's been done. And there's so many good things that the department are involved in, and particularly TransLink in terms of decarbonisation agenda. But just this EV car thing is it's just losing the will to live really with the whole thing and people when they're looking at an EV car they're just like look the charging network is dead dreadful but there's nothing nothing authoritative or inspirational or clear from the department on how to fix it okay. I, I hear you and I suppose the only assurance that I can offer on behalf of the minister is that she is aware of all of the issues she has an action plan in terms of getting us to the point at which we can give more clarity about what's going to happen and time scales. Um, and a lot of that, um, I, I am very much um, waiting for the research on what an EV network, what, what the right shape of network is for here. Um, but I don't have that yet, and it would be wrong for me to set, to set dates without having more background knowledge. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm also conscious of time. So the other issue is around councils. So the councils are a key part of government in Northern Ireland, very connected to communities, yeah. and the department's been very keen to work with them in terms of delivering active travel initiatives, particularly mm. greenways and also EV charging network. But you also know about the financial situations that our councils face in terms of the downturn in, uh, in revenue and also particular increased costs as well that they're experiencing. But yet we're asking them to take forward some of these initiatives, some of which they're having to part fund. And there's anything more that can be done to help them in terms of that funding to ensure, because I've spoken to at least one council, they're asking them to take forward the EV charge network. They don't have statutory responsibility for it. So the first question the councillors are going to turn back and go, why are we doing this when we're tough financial mm -hmm. situations. Is there anything more that can be work done where the department are working in true, genuine partnership with them to help them with this? I'm developing a proposal at the moment that could potentially be funded from the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund that would both support councils and help with some of the match funding. So we are looking at that and we are working on it. Um, you know, in terms of, um, I mean, there are also some practical issues for them um, about how to do this. Um, and we have we have solutions to the practical issues now, um, but we know that we need to put more support in just in terms of program management and supporting the applications through to OZ. Yeah, thank you, Liz. That's that's appreciated. Yeah. One last thing, just about modal change, because you talked about that yeah. during your, your your opening remarks. Um, during the pandemic, we were all told do not use public transport unless it's really, really essential. So that message went out at the very beginning, which was devastating for public transport, because the message previously was, use bus and train, it's good for you, it's good for the environment, but then the message was sent, don't use it unless you actually have to. We're going to need to ensure that when we're coming out of this, that is isn't a car-led recovery. Now, e-cars mm -hmm. accepted. <laughs> so we have to ensure that, that we avoid that, and we're encouraging people to get back on the bus and train. And we can't just do that by just saying, it's there, give it a go. Mm -hmm. What more is the department doing to try to encourage more people to come back to public transport and use that, particularly in terms of concessionary fares for particularly younger people who would be more inclined then once they finish their concessionary fares to then start using the private car? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe take that and then pass over to Chris for a bit of the detail around the TransLink plan. Um, so TransLink, do you have a plan to, to encourage recovery and encourage people back on to public transport? But I'll let Chris do that in a minute. In relation to concessionary fares, we are looking at what we can do around concessionary fares, but it has to be borne in mind that the concessionary fares scheme at the moment is underfunded. So obviously last year with the reduction in the amount of people who were using public transport, it wasn't a problem for us. But in previous years, and what we will anticipate as numbers come back, the concessionary first scheme is underfunded by in the region of seven or eight million pounds a year, and that is only going to increase. Um, so the minister is looking at this scheme and is looking at options, but until we address the, the fundamental issue around that underfunding, we have very limited options for moving forward. Um, but she, Minister Mallon has been engaged with Minister Murphy on this um, and continues to do so. 
Um, so Chris, maybe on the Translink um, return of passengers? Yeah, no problem, Jackie. So uh, as you rightly said, Jackie, Translink has put together a plan that will hopefully bring about the recovery of public transport after the COVID pandemic, pandemic and has been moved through the recovery. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, that is linked directly to the, the pathway to recovery and at each stage we're trying to take a focus on what's appropriate at that time. So, for the first few stages, this is about reminding the, the public around the actual restrictions um, put forward by public health and, and our health colleagues. But then also we're then trying to build upon that to, to remind people that public transport is safe. So, we have a lot of um, material around that that we'll seek to try and show the the mechanisms that we've put in place during this pandemic and will continue to do to ensure the safety of people. Moving forward then, like you rightly said, as we go through this um, recovery, we are going to see people come back. And part of the issues, number one for us, is actually engaging on the capacity of our public transport. With social distancing at the minute, that's quite difficult. So we're engaging internally within the sun service to to make sure that as we use restrictions, we know the impact on our public transport network because we only have a certain amount of buses and trains and bus drivers and train drivers, so we will hit a limit. So we are working through that to make sure, and with our colleagues across the water as well, to make sure that we can bring about the safest amount of capacity for people. And Transing's plan also will look at promotional activity. Um, so that will be coming forward as we move through this, and we'll obviously have to bring something to the minister. When we talk about promotional activity, that generally comes at a cost. Um, and we're at very early doors, but from a public transport perspective this year, our initial indication is budgets are going to be very difficult. But that's something that we'll approach with an open mind and, and see what we can do to bring forward. But this five stage plan going through, it, it's something that's encouraging. We're very clear, the message is very clear that there has to be a, we build back better in a green recovery, and this is our first step in that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for the use of this room. So can I apologise to those members who have indicated and perhaps that they could provide their questions to the clerk in writing and we can forward then to the department for a response. So can I thank you all for attending this morning. Um, it has been incredibly useful and, and we will be returning to this again. So um, uh, and just to follow up on, on a number of points, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Okay, um, apologies <coughs> to, to members who were unable to ask questions. There were quite a number of you, so if you could actually forward um, any questions that you do have um, directly through to Alison, that they will then be forwarded then on to the department. Chair. Yes, Ms. Alison. Chair, can I come in? Chair, as someone who was waiting to ask a question, and I know it is difficult when you're trying to chair like that, but perhaps one of the ways we need to do it is just look at the time we have and divide it up so that we can all try and get in because there were questions I was trying to get in around hydrogen and dairy in the northwest, but um, I will send them on. Okay, thank you. Um, moving then to our forward work programme, just to draw your attention to that at page 156 of members are content. Do Please. members have any other business that they'd like to raise at this point in the meeting? <coughs> Oh, okay. Sure, if I could maybe come in just uh, on one point, just relating to everything we've discussed there this morning around electric vehicles, would it be um, feasible maybe for the committee to, to put together a motion to look at the issues um, in relation to this? Because I do think um, that there is a lot of work to be done there and, and it's something we could maybe try and move forward as a committee. Sorry, we wanted to put together... A motion. Um, I think it's really the point. I mean, this is all part of our inquiry, so I suppose really it would be encapsulated then, you know, if we're working towards sort of mid to late June, that that would be part of that. Um, okay. We'd have a committee, we'd have a, we'd have a report and a motion would then come out of that report. If okay. No, that's fair enough. That's grand. Okay, yeah, no, take your point. I absolutely appreciate what you're saying, but I think, I mean, I suppose it's all part of the, the, the process of this piece of work. Chair, I just wondered, would it be in order, given the, the points raised about the East Border region and their funding, yeah. you know, for the charges, whether well, you might alert them to having received the briefing, that they might reflect on the voltage of the charges that they're considering? Then. Okay. If, well, maybe what we might need to do is write to SEPB um, with regard to that project and get some more information yeah. and highlight the, the challenges that are being presented. But also with okay. the East Border, you know, I'm sure, well, I'm sure we'll speak to East, colleagues. Yeah, because East, East Border region are leading on it, aren't they? So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, members are content that our next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, 26th of May, in the Senate Chamber. Um, and can I just advise those members here with us today just to um, maintain social distancing and take all their belongings with them? So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Northern okay. Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.